All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Historic Preservation Commission, Tuesday, June 19th, 2018. Please note that Commissioner Hiller is absent tonight. Everyone else is present. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the meeting minutes for May 15th. Are there any comments or changes to those meeting minutes? Nope. All right. Can we have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes as presented. All right. Can I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And any abstentions? All right. We're good. Item number four on the agenda is a five-minute field guide from Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Chairman Roy. Uh, for those of you who may be joining for the first time in a couple of months, we've started something new here at the Commission where we are doing a five-minute field guide. And the five-minute field guide is simply an introduction to some architectural or historic preservation aspect um, to uh, provide some education and to inform the public and the commission about some particular element. So tonight we're going to talk about glass. Um, we talk often at the Historic Preservation Commission about historic windows, and we concentrate on their size, their materials, their configuration. Um, and we often relate the windows to how they relate particularly to a particular period of architecture. Um, in many windows uh, where there's just clear glazing, the significance of the uh, glazing is easily understood. However, in some cases, the glazing details are the significant detail of the window unit because of its functional purpose, its artistic design, and its interior aesthetics, or possibly a combination of all of those factors. The design and placement of windows is typically related to the building use, function, aesthetics, and a desire to control natural light and views, as these examples all show from different periods of architecture. In architectural design of all eras, regardless of the window type, glass is the singular material that bridges both exterior design with the interior decoration. The visual nature of glass, a condition of its manufacturing process and treatments, contributes to the overall significance of historic glazing. Over the course of centuries, various manufacturing techniques have improved the clarity and uniformity of glass, beginning with drawn sheet glass, cast plate glass, polished plate glass, prism glass, rolled figured pattern glass, and what we see most often today, float glass. From a building's ex exterior, glass allows an architect or builder to obscure or exploit the interiors of his or her buildings. From a building's interior, glass enables the architect or builder to reject or embrace the surrounding environment. Examples of controlling the impact of the exterior environment are often found in churches or libraries, uh, where the idea is to bring in light but, not, but to separate the uh, interior function from the outside world. Or, um, as in the examples of many prairie school architects where they used art glass to obscure the exterior but still want the uh, outside environment to uh, creep into their interiors. Or in the full evolution of, of modernism and the international style and the advancement of glass which allowed the exterior to be completely melded with the interior. <clears throat> Oftentimes, glass is used to be a decorative element as part of the interior decoration, but uh, many types of glass were designed to also let filtered light in. One of those types of glass that you would see often in uh, mid-19th century churches or in libraries was Griselle, which is that fine um, drawn black lines or gray lines and uh, artwork, figure work on white glass that allowed light to come in in a diffuse pattern, but also um, prevented the people inside the space from looking out and being distracted. So again, it was an ideal uh, type of, 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 of glazing to um, facilitate getting light into an interior, but keeping the exterior world at bay. Stained glass uh, windows come in a variety of styles and designs from unique one-of-a-kind windows by famed Tiffany Studios or mass-produced windows sold through catalogs, leaded art glass windows separated the outside world from the interior world. Most are familiar with church windows which sought to separate the worldly environment from the spiritual environment. 
However, residential examples of art glass were found in many homes, particularly in late Victorian era entry vestibules and stair halls. They were used in those stair halls for a specific purpose because during that period, um, the idea was to minimize the harsh glare on the interior um, in, in those entry halls because the custom of the day was for women to receive their guests and, and descend down the staircase to meet people in a vestibule. And the idea in the late Victorian period was not to have a glare behind the woman so she could be seen in full, um, uh, full light and also um, to provide the most dramatic setting to decide whether or not um, she wanted to receive the guest and invite the guest into the formal parlors uh, further into the home. So the foyer was a very important place and that's why you will see on lots of uh, late Victorian period homes, uh, you'll see very elaborate art glass in the vestibules. During the, uh, 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 the beginning of the, the, uh, the end of the late 19th century, the beginning of the early 20th century, um, Victorian customs started to wane and architecture responded to that. Um, no more were the, were the strict customs of calling on the woman of the house uh, held in such strict order, and the idea was that bringing more natural light into the home uh, made for a more pleasant and helpful environment. And so there were some ad advances in the way art glass and leaded glass were used in homes, uh, including using just clear beveled glass that create a prismatic effect of color throughout a room, um, depending on the time of day, and also the use of uh, colored glasses, glass and etched glass that were created with different types of chemicals and acids, again, to create particular hues in, in uh, various rooms. The, manip the manipulation of light was not only used in residential examples, but was also used in commercial examples. And one of the advances at the late uh, 19th century, the early 20th century, was the use of prismatic glass. Um, prismatic glass um, was not only a decorative element found in storefronts, but had a specific purpose of eliminating the danger of gas lighting in long, deep commercial stores and allowing the light to be refracted and travel deeper into the store space. Uh, so these transoms that were made of these little squares of prismatic glass, um, again, were not a, a simply an aesthetic choice, but they were actually a technological advancement to um, light the interiors of commercial spaces. You can see the example in the uh, corner here. This was a, a prismatic glass designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the, he applied a decorative element to the surface at the, st at the street, um, and there were lots of different um, designs embossed on that uh, element, and you can see the horizontal prisms um, behind the, the design. Luxfer was probably the, the best known of the, the manufacturers of prism glass, and, um, uh, and, and they, they kind of uh, developed the, the, the entire industry and then others followed. Uh, one of the things that we deal with in historic preservation is that uh, before World War I, manganese was added to uh, decolorize the green glass, and over time with exposure to ultraviolet light, it has turned a lavender purple or, or a light pink rose color. And so when doing preservation work, um, that needs to be taken into consideration when you're matching glass in a historic storefront. The other thing that's interesting about storefronts that have lux for glass, it tells us a little bit about where the historic awning ought to be placed. Because if, if a transom does not have prismatic glass, the awning was typically mounted right below the cast iron lintel. But if a prismatic transom was added to the storefront, that was often exposed so the sunlight could get into the building um, and, and provide the benefits of which, for which it was intended. The idea of prismatic glass then translated also to sidewalk glass. Some of you have probably seen this. Um, it, it did serve a dual purpose in commercial buildings where there were vaults under the uh, public sidewalks for service. Um, it allowed the people who were doing uh, the service work in the basements to be able to see a little more clearly, again, without expensive uh, of, of, of lighting. Um, but also many department stores employed this technique so they could make their, the basements of their uh, department stores much more accessible to the public and brighter and uh, therefore more inviting to patrons and customers. 
Prairie School architects such as Frank Lloyd Wright were masterful in designing art glass panels that connected the natural environment while screening out undesirable views. Uh, these are all examples of Prairie School designs. You can see how they were effectively used either to screen things out at the lower level or um, uh, out screening out the, the lower level of trees and just seeing the natural branches and, and things that were um, uh, uh, natural elements that would have been appealing to the Prairie School architects. Glass can also serve as a unifying element between the interior and the exterior. Again, later work of Frank Lloyd Wright at the upper uh, um, image, one of his Usonian houses, the uh, Pope Leahy house, um, and then examples from the international style with the lower left being our locally uh, known Farnsworth house in Plano, Illinois. One of the innovations was the use of obsc uh, making obscure or patterned or figured glass. This was made by uh, pouring molten glass onto cast iron sheets that had a, a pattern um, embossed in the cast iron, and then it was rolled out. This glass came into popularity um, at the end of the 19th century and was used all the way up until World War II, with, with, uh, uh, was fairly common. Um, it was used where privacy was required, but um, high levels of light were desired. So you often find this in residential bathrooms, uh, public restrooms, or executive offices or conference rooms. And then one of the last innovations of, of the 20th century was the advent of the glass brick or the glass block, um, which came in a variety of shapes and sizes, starting in, very util in a very utilitarian form in the 1920s. Um, and advancing all the way up to the 1960s with ceramic fritz and all sorts of different designs and uh, functions or, or, or patterns to them. They could be easily integrated into the architecture and create the smooth lines of the modern um, as well as fitting with the international style. <clears throat> so for the preservationist, understand the aesthetic goals, the functional placement and social customs associated with various types of glazing are an essential component in the determination of the significance of windows in historic buildings. And that is the end of this month's Five Minute Field Guide. I hope that was brought some information to uh, people who don't think about glass as much as maybe we ought to. Well, that was fantastic. I, lots of, uh, oh, stuff we didn't know. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, tonight we have three concept plan unit developments that we're going to look at uh, before we get to the building permit applications. The first one we're going to talk about is 227 Ford Street. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, we are going to talk about 227 Ford Street, which is a concept review. It is in the northern portion of the local Geneva Historic District and is a contributing building in the uh, North Geneva Historic District that is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The building is documented to have been built uh, in 1853. It is an upright and wing with uh, Greek Revival influences. Um, these pictures should help cool you off um, this evening. Uh, I've been working with the, uh, the applicant Rick Nealis and his architect Sean Gallagher since uh, I think mid-December. Um, so we have some wintry scenes to cool you off tonight. Um, the uh, home uh, has gone, undergone several uh, modifications over time. However, it does retain many of its uh, original characteristics. So the wide entablature or eave detail at the roof line survives, the front door survives, and uh, many of the windows um, on the Ford Street facade are original historic windows. Um, in fact, uh, between 1936 and 1939, the house was remodeled with the addition of the one-story flat-roofed addition to the west. And when that addition was made, they took the windows off the west facade of the home and moved those to the south wall of the new addition. So even in the 1936 addition, it is historic windows. However, also in that remodeling to uh, make the second floor more inhabitable, habitable and um, um, uh, to provide some more light. They did add dormers around the home and added windows that are of a later uh, period, but again, similar to the historic windows. The house um, is covered at this point with shingle siding. For those of you who have visited, you have noticed that. Um, there are some 
unique considerations for this particular um, house. And one reason I chose to keep the winter scenes in because this kind of ex uh, so, uh, shows this very well. Um, when the dormer was put in on the upper uh, right above the door that's shown in the right photograph, um, you can see that it created a lot of water um, that would come down right over the front door. Um, that is one of the things that the uh, applicant wants to discuss with you tonight. In fact, when we were there in December, there was a rather large, dangerous icicle about the size of a human being um, hanging over the door. Um, and uh, so that is one uh, area they would like to discuss with the commission. Uh, going around the house, this is the west uh, facade. So this is the side facing North 3rd Street. This is the side that is being proposed to change the most dramatic, dramatically. Um, this is not being pursued as a tax assessment freeze project. Um, so this is only going under local review. The um, portion of the home at the far left in the, in the upper left image was originally a garage. It has been attached to the house and has been converted to living space. Um, but it does not have a known foundation under it. Um, again, the view of the, um, the former garage from the north. And then uh, going around the rear again, uh, these are visible currently from the street, but they would not be visible in the proposal. Um, there, are, uh, there is a kitchen and a, a screen porch that are both in, um, they are both in uh, distressed condition and um, are being proposed to be removed as part of the proposal. <clears throat> I won't go into detail heavily, but I did want to just introduce um, the drawings to you and I will let the applicant and, and uh, the architect uh, describe them in greater detail. But one of the things to note about this house is this was uh, built before zoning was put in place in Geneva. And so the 1936-1939 um, the wing uh, extends wing uh, extends out uh, uh, to and actually a little bit past the lot line. Um, and the um, parts of the building that are shaded are um, not within the uh, current zoning, uh, re uh, in the required yards for, for, for zoning. So they've, uh, these are the existing uh, elevations of the home, and I, I'm, I, there's several drawings here that I'm just going to let uh, them describe, but uh, just to give you an idea, it's a very, very small house uh, currently, and um, the proposal is to add a new two-story addition to the north side of the building that would replace the former garage, the um, existing kitchen wing, and the screen porch. Um, so uh, this is the um, information that was submitted um, originally for the design and um, for, for the west addition, or the west elevation, I'm sorry. Um, and again, the other elevations. One of the things that I will just point out, and I know will be discussed further, is one of the things that uh, we have discussed as this project has evolved is how the addition would be viewed from the public street because that's where we review um, from. And so this uh, diagram is uh, indicating where a standard height person would be standing on the public sidewalk and how the current house would um, um, block a large portion of the view of the two, full two-story addition at the, at the rear. Um, there is also a proposed detached garage um, that uh, is, is going to be built um, at, at the rear of the property. Um, I will let them explain the floor plans and there also is an alternate um, elevation that I will let the uh, applicant and the architect walk through these with you. So at this point, I understand that Mr. Nealis would like to speak first, perhaps. And so we'll introduce Mr. Rick Nealis and then Sean Gallagher will join you, join him. Yes. And the garage. And the garage. Yes. So if you need to reference any slides, this will take you back. This will take you forward. I'm just going to talk. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh. Well, good evening. Hello. My name is Rick Nealis. Um, Kathy and I are looking forward to the restoration and construction of the property at 227 Ford. I've lived in Batavia since 1990. Um, I have also... Um, done a renovation of a historic property in Batavia at 510 South Batavia Avenue. Um, I purchased that in 1995, a 1902 Victorian style house. Um, when I purchased it, um, it was in a deteriorating state. Um, and 
really in need of uh, a facelift. The <clears throat> over a five year period, I converted it to office space and uh, it was a very expensive and dis difficult project. But if you see it today, it's a beautiful, really restored Victorian style home and it houses five local businesses, including my own. Kathy and I have enjoyed uh, Geneva for many, many years. The restaurants, the shopping, the festivals, events are our common destinations. The small town and historic appeal is something that's hard to find anywhere. So the Ford property would be something of a dream come true for us. The renovation of the property at 227 Ford is quite challenging. Um, it's in a major state of disrepair and it's been an eyesore to the community for many years. The current occupants are an elderly couple and they simply don't have the resources necessary to maintain this kind of a property. Um, unless a major investment's made it, um, within the near future, um, this property could become uh, not salvageable. Kathy and I look at the uh, Ford renovation as two uh, distinct projects. First is the uh, Ford Street um, facade. Uh, we love the way the facade looks um, and we want to see it restored. There's uh, two issues with it. One is the uh, railing, the decorative railing over the uh, um, southeast corner and that needs to be replaced because it's um, deteriorated. And then the front door um, as Michael stated, uh, there was a huge uh, icicle hanging down, but there has been water coming in over that door into the foundation for many, many years. And uh, I expect once we get into this, um, we're gonna be having structural problems underneath that door. Also, the bottom of the door is no longer existent. Um, there's actually, uh, when you, we went in, there's things, bags stuffed under it um, in the winter time, otherwise there would be a three to four inch gap. So the uh, front door, um, it, it needs to be uh, restored. And uh, the canopy is an, a design that uh, Kathy and I are, would like to add. I think it adds some distinction to this property. But other than that, um, we wanna just restore the uh, exterior as it is, fix it up and paint it and, and keep it. I mean, we think it's a beautiful, uh, facade. Inside, um, the, the first floor, we want to gut it and then restore it back to uh, its condition. The second story has uh, three tiny bedrooms in it and a powder room. Um, we just, we'd like to make that a single bedroom with a full bathroom. Um, the second leg of the project is the third street part of the project. Um, there the problems are quite severe. The uh, kitchen, um, the foundation under it is literally crumbling and you can see the floor is buckling from it and it's, it's not salvageable. The, uh, there's a bathroom on the first floor that is barely functioning and the uh, reference to the bedroom that was a garage um, it's in such a deplorable state that neither Kathy and I have had the gumption to go into it. Um, it has been neglected considerably for the years. So what we would like to do along 3rd Street is to, uh, to remove the garage area, the, the uh, bathroom and the kitchen and to rebuild it. So along 3rd, we would like to have a master bedroom suite um, and a separate entrance on third. And then behind it, we would have a kitchen that would lead out to a screened in porch and a deck. Uh, second floor on the addition would be another bedroom with a bathroom. We'd be also interested in putting a basement and then on the north end of the property, a two car garage. This project would restore and preserve much of the historically significant uh, structure on Ford Street and it would add a substantial new addition on 3rd Street that would complement the Ford Street historic frontage. The addition would turn the property from an eyesore into one which would be beautify the area along with the other restored properties for many years to come. We hope you uh, find support to our project and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
So at this time, I thought I'd step up and uh, maybe walk you through our proposal and some of the thoughts we had behind the concept. Michael, can I? Thank you. They own the property. Oh, they own? Okay. So for the time being, the folks that are in the house right now are essentially renting it back. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to talk about Scott at all? <laughs> Can I say something before I launch into this? I that would be really distracting. Would it? <laughs> okay. Then 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 I then I'll then I'll talk about it later. Never mind. All right. Okay. All right. So all this to say, um, and will this allow me to scroll? Good. Okay. Great. Um, in terms of the project, the height of this house is just at 20 feet. Our addition is 24 feet and we have as high as at least 32 feet depending on setbacks we can get almost as close as 34 feet so to that end we are working on a house that is quite small short diminutive sort of thing so in working with that um, as Rick mentioned the F the Ford Street as well as the 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 third street side of the original house are going to be restored windows will be restored we are going to propose that at least with the restored windows we would do uh, Marvin uh, wood combination screen storm units to help protect them some of them have storms some have screens some have nothing and so they're in, in really um, rough shape but they are they are salvageable so um, it is a it is a shingle sided house uh, over uh, a lap siding, but we are going to maintain the shingle siding on the house and restore that. The canopy itself um, is a, uh, a wood structure uh, with structural wood brackets and a copper standing seam um, roof over it. And so you see it over here, um, right? So that little canopy element in keeping with the Greek revival. Uh, the rails, again, the rails in this case, um, and the newels will be uh, made of a, uh, an AZAC material. Uh, and I see we have an AZAC representative here today. Uh, and that material uh, will be for paint and uh, um, the rails and then also the, uh, the sort of balustrades that we're creating in there, the woven balusters, uh, will be for paint as well. Um, in terms of the elevation that you see from Third Street, and Mrs. Zinke, I appreciate your sort of bringing us into where we, we need to focus the, the attention. And the, the Ford Street side, or the Third Street side, I'm sorry. Um, we have two proposals in front of you today, and I want to say um, I appreciate uh, Michael Lambert and kind of the, the back and forth. He sent me a couple of thoughts last Thursday. And so uh, we want to propose that we look at this version um, uh, over the version here, um, in part because what it does is it actually brings the roof line down a touch. Um, so what we're doing essentially is we're, we're carrying uh, the ridge all the way through and we're simply lowering the wall plate at the stair structure here. That's a stair that we're carrying there. Uh, we're cutting the dormers in. The dormers are a little bit smaller than the ones shown in the initial proposal, so the scale of those uh, is in keeping with that. We're also setting, in the case of the one dormer, actually each of these dormers are essentially centered on the windows. In this case, these are uh, used in the master bath and master closet, and this is a laundry room and master bath uh, toilet room. Uh, you'll also notice that in this portion here on the side, this is where the old bathroom is right now. That has been a real problem area because a lot of water is dumping down into that area causing a great deal of damage to the wall as well as the window that sits here currently. Uh, we are going to put a little canopy over that and use that as an entry for uh, the side. So if we look at the plan, the floor plan here, um, let's focus on this side. Um, <laughs> so the garage is over in this area. We're going to come down a walkway into here into a mudroom. And then this is the master suite that runs the, along 3rd Street. The kitchen is off to the side to the, uh, to the west, or I'm sorry, to the east. Um, and then you have the stair element that goes up to this new second floor. Our new second floor sits here. And then we have a couple of steps up to a second bedroom above our master suite uh, area. Um, 
The remodeling of the front of the house, as Rick mentioned, uh, we, we essentially convert three extremely tiny bedrooms that actually are essentially closets for each room into a bedroom with then uh, a little office space and a bathroom off of that. Each, each of these bedrooms has its own uh, bathroom. So if we go back to these images here, um, we see that um, a, this is the stair element, this is the bathroom upstairs, this is the second story uh, bedroom, and then this is the master suite here. You can see a little bit of the garage, the detached garage there uh, along 3rd Street. The material for our addition is going to be hardy plank. It's going to be smooth. The trim will be uh, LP, smart trim. Um, and uh, we have modified the, the gable look. In, on the original house, it has what I affectionately call pork chops. They have returns on the ends of the gables. So um, let's take a look at the existing, oh yeah, okay. So you'll notice that there's this sort of return here on the freeze board. It's like a little pork chop shape. We are uh, sort of streamlining the, the design to sort of offset it by, by not having a return. We're simply gonna bring the, um, the rake line down into a, a crown profile and then return it back to the roof line. So um, just a slight difference in what's uh, the existing profile uh, to what is going to be new um, there. So this is the scheme again that we're showing. Um, in terms of trim, around the windows, we're gonna match existing uh, in terms of size and profile depth and whatnot. Uh, the siding will be a lap siding. It will not be a shingle siding, it will be a lap siding. So it will have a sort of distinction from the original house and uh, its lap will be a six inch exposure. Uh, shingles will all be architectural dimensional shingles. Uh, the existing house will also receive new shingles as well. Um, and then in terms of uh, lot area and lot coverage, these sorts of questions, I know, Carolyn, you'll sometimes ask about that, so I might as well address that. Um, in terms of allowable, we're allowed 37, uh, or 3,796 square feet. We actually have 3,752, so we're about 45 square feet under that on lot coverage. In terms of building area, um, we are allowed 3,529 square feet. The actual is 3,331. So we're about 198 square feet under. Worth noting, the second floor of this house, original house, does not count towards floor area. So the house is that short. So a little bit of the second floor counts in our addition. Um, and actually these calculations are based on my original elevations. It'll actually be even less now. So, um, I gave you the height and um, I did send an email out that sort of um, itemizes everything and, and I think Michael did a nice job of sort of summarizing all of the scope um, to that end. Um, I'm, I'm open to answering any and all questions you may have. You're going to speak first. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk first. I, when I first looked at this, I, I thought that the uh, the, the, on the Ford Street side, that the canopy was a little bit of false historicism, and that's the only issue I had with the Ford Street side. I understand now why you're doing what you're doing, and I, I'm not sure you can come up with a better solution than that that isn't false historicism. So it's kind of a compromise of that... Yeah. that that's going to work. That's probably going to work for me. I mean, I. It. it I think if he did the returns, then to me that would be kind of the false. Historical. Yeah, I, I still, I still think I don't know. I mean, it. I'd rather not have it at all, but I understand why you have it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if if you added a gutter, it wouldn't. It, there's too much water coming down at that point. Yeah. It it breaches. It would breach that, and then you'd have a human-sized icicle. <laughs> okay well that so the front I mean and I think the the uh, replacement of the the the, uh, the railing is fine too I don't mm -hmm. and since it's high enough up I don't have a problem going with the maintenance free version of that and not yeah. being wood so mm -hmm. uh, the 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 problem I have with the third street side 
it's not really a problem. The, the issue I have with the Third Street side, I would really like to see <laughs> the whole house or the, the Third Street addition almost mirrored so the one story addition would be on the side that connects to the house and then the two story was on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I know planning wise, I'm not sure you can get that to work, but I'd really like to see a one story link more than this, what appears to be a larger two story space slamming into this diminutive house. Mm. Uh, and it, it's, I know it's a difficult thing to do, but even if you had something, I mean, it. it I, I don't know whether you've looked at how much you can change the roof height of the of the stair section there to mm -hmm. try to get that to become the link and bring it down. If you can bring that down any farther, I don't know. That's the only. That's that's the problem I have with the. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd like to see a distinct link there and not just hmm. this two-story come into it. Mm -hmm. So you think the change in material and all of that doesn't doesn't do enough? I don't think to it separate it. I don't think it does. I think it's I. I just feel like it. it it would. It doesn't let the house kind of stand on the existing house stand on its own. Sure. Hmm. So. Yeah. I. Yeah. I mean. I, I. I see where you're coming. I could. I could compress the roof line a touch, uh, on that stair. But in terms of the planning of, you know, mudroom into kitchen into the link that goes into a master suite. I mean, the sequencing of everything is such that, you know, in and in theory we could actually even do two stories over the master but we we tried to pull back a little bit on that so it's not you know the mass of it sort of steps down as it it heads uh, north from uh, from that portion but could you change the ridge height of the stair portion of that right like i said we might be able to compress the plate height here and then allow that to come a little bit lower that may be a possibility but then you also from from what would be the ford street side you then have another roof line here right coming in so um, yeah, it gets a little busier from the Ford Street, but yeah, that I don't think it would. I don't think it would be as busy from the Ford Street side as you think, because again, you'd have the, the elements would be so far back at sure. that point. Yeah. I, can you show me the second floor one more time? Sure. So here's the second floor here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, because you have you have a. You have a stair, and then you have like a little sitting area back right, over there. Right, right. So in theory, what we could do is bring these plate heights down, and yeah. then have the yeah. have the roof and line I, drop down. I would almost like to see the ridge height come down, and I know that that's probably more expensive to do. Well, when you say the ridge height, are you are you saying then that this ridge height no, as well? Not the, not, right. Not so this ridge could just, come down. Yeah, that, yeah. the no, ridge that, of the stair. Sure. The stair as an element itself, and then right. maybe it'll. I, I'm, I'm, I'm well, trying to, I, ideally, ideally, yeah. I would have it not any higher than the existing house, but I don't know whether you could even get to that. Yeah, well, I mean, you got head heights and, you know, 6'8 and all that good stuff. I um, understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so to that end, what could happen is we could bring that roof line down uh, to somewhere in here. I, my recommendation would actually be to just simply carry it till it becomes a ridge here, so... Oh, I mean, yeah. That's going to be easier to construct, and then you can maintain the plate up there. Um, I mean, that's another approach to it. I mean, and I, if that I would think, be amenable to you, I, I, I have no objections to, well, to tweaking it, the design. Well, it's an idea to Sure, to no, look at. I, mean, I appreciate that. that, that, that that's yeah. the, but but my, my idea would be is to try to get more of a mm -hmm. connection between... No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Sure, yeah, so. yeah. In trying to create a transition that transition is from to here to a lower yeah, element exactly. to a higher element. Yeah, and then back exactly. down. Sure. No, I appreciate that. Okay. But other than that, it, it is a, I think it's a fine design, and it really does, I think you, it was difficult to tell what was old and what was <laughs> new in oh. the way of, like, the plan itself, but sure. it, it was able to work it out. So it, Good. It, uh, Good. Any other comments? Can can you go?
Can, can you go? Can you go back to the, the current? Oh, the, the original or the existing house. Yeah. And then the west side. I'm trying to orient myself here. That's the, the it's one with the right. right above this finger. So that's the west. Right. So this is Third Street. And that's the garage that he's. Correct. So that's what's coming. And then, off. and then this piece here is the kitchen. Uh, but you can't really see it. It's sort of obscured back here. The roof line is back there. I guess I, looking at the, what's proposed. I mean, I. I, I almost feel like where, you know, where that doorway is on right there, you know, create some separation yeah. between that first level yeah. and the second, you know, cause it is, it is, it appears to be set back. It is. Yeah. Um, and there is a little roof line that kind of bridges between the one story piece and there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do, I do like maintaining the ridge line and, and, mm -hmm. uh, doing what we can to lower the house. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm glad to see work being done and, and the amount of restoration that's being proposed here. Good. And, and I'd be... It's a terrific old house. It is. It's a, it's a gem. I, I, I really don't have any, any concerns, any significant concerns with this. Uh, it's right here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking that the canopy over the door, which I understand, is, seems to be really critical. I think it's a little too complicated. Could you, could you um, use the? It isn't a canopy over the window that is right to above it and to the right, but it's the peak that goes over the, the long window that goes through the. Um, so, so that so that it's open, so that there's yes. no front to it. Okay. And perhaps the brackets that come down. Mm -hmm. um, how, how are the brackets going to look from the side? Uh, we have a side elevation. Uh, let's see if we can find that. Ah, um, uh, well, rats. You really can't see it very well. Uh, maybe this. Uh, yeah, so it'd be sort of an OG profile that sort of flares out and then, I mean, it projects out probably about 30 inches at most, um, but it's going to have a, a five-quarter backboard and then it's going to kind of flare out in a sort of an OG profile. Instead of it being like a straight bracket or a sort of an arts and crafts curve sort of thing, it's going to have sort of an OG profile to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Greek Revival, um, I'll consult with Michael about what would be an appropriate profile, but I think an OG probably would be appropriate for this style. Yeah. It could be. A, we can talk about some Greek Revival details. Sure. See what you and your yeah. client. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. Um, w one concern I have about opening it up is how do I keep it from going out? So <laughs> um, when you start to land stuff on it, um, it naturally wants to pull out, so you need something to tie across. So that's in part what the front of this does. And we are, in a way, threading the needle, um, for lack of a better term, between a historic head casing that we're going to keep and the window sill right here. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're trying to, and one thought was, well, maybe we could do a shed style. But you can't because the way this window aligns, the shed actually hits the window. So, you know, we, we're trying to you know, really make it work for this. So I could certainly look at something that, again, I don't want to get too flourished on this because, I mean, you could do sort of an arch, too, across it. But I don't know if that'd be, I, I don't yeah, think that right. Work with the style. Right, yeah. But that opens it up, That's and it still keeps the, the tie together, so.
sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could we could kind of draw down the amount of uh, of uh, trim. I mean, we do have a couple layers of cove and, and and crown on there to to give it a little bit more character. But I wouldn't want to get too you know too naked with it, too too overly simplified. But we could certainly simplify it a touch. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it might not even be a better idea to make have that more glass okay. so that it is so it's 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 very it's very light, very bright, and that also might add uh, a way to uh, differentiate between the two buildings. So have a paired side light so that it, so here I here I'm gonna show you the plan at this point and, and show you kind of why we've decided to do a single 36 inch service door and a side light. Though we could do an oversized, say 42 inch full view door there. Um, we have, so this becomes a mudroom, right? And so you've got a 36 inch door, you've got about two and a half inches of mall space and then about a 14 inch side light, giving us just enough room for essentially a bench and then cubbies or storage in that, that little room. But, but one, way to, one way to kind of switch things up is to do an oversized door. I mean, that's another option for that. Um, you're still gonna get the same amount of light, but you know, it does kind of create a distinction. Okay. Just wonder if maybe you could um, make the structure a little bit thinner, have a little bit more glass and a little less structure in that door to let more light in and oh in terms of the the kind of sticking in the the railing on it uh so instead of it yeah okay so maybe being a full view french door versus uh something that looks more like a side service door it's kind of to what carolyn's saying is yeah yeah, how yeah. You separate the old and the new and, sure and glass is a great way to do that right it's a good theme right it's a good thing we're talking about it tonight <laughs> didn't think about it until, right. you know, 10 minutes ago. Yeah. It, it might also, well, it might make the, the whole area look a little simpler sure. rather than a little too fussy. Good. And I, was, I was just curious, um, do you know off the top of your head what the square footage of the, of the, of the original house, uh, I don't mean, no, uh, what's going to be left of the original house is? Um, I don't, but I sure could get that to you. I mean, right off the top of my head, I don't. Okay. I don't. I, would, I wanted to compare what the square footage of the new addition would be sure. what's left of the new addition. Well, we, I mean, we could just kind of at least quickly look at the floor plans. Yeah. So, so here is the, this is all outlining the original house, okay? okay? This is the one-story piece here, okay? This is really the, the original house. There is a kitchen that's back in here, and then that garage sits over here. So uh, we probably have some existing plans, right, Michael? See existing. Uh, ah, there, there. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, here's the first floor. So so here is what we're keeping. All of this here. Okay. This is where we're entering now into a kind of a side mudroom where you're talking about the doors. This is that garage, and then this is the kitchen, which is actually kind of falling into the earth. Um, yeah. So I, you can see it visually. I don't have a number for you. I can get that. Absolutely, I can get that. Just looking at the drawings, I'm going to get something like uh, one, one part is the is the kitchen, and one part is the what will be left of the original house, and two parts will be the addition. Looking at it, is that a scene? Uh, it, it probably is somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if we look at this, well, actually, so if you look at the foundation plan, here's the addition. Yeah. So it's it's like 1.5 to 1 sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Other comments? On the on the garage. Yeah. The the treatment, the lap, and the, the windows. All, everything's going to be the same to match the addition. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the material will all be the same too. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking at that third street side and. I was just thinking of the jumble. It's a big jumble, mm -hmm. bunch of little things, and mm -hmm. and I think you've really brought it together. And 
and made it actually a house rather than Good. just a bunch of yeah. planes that are all in different le levels. And Good. Well, I appreciate and that. I like what you're what you're doing with the materials and mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And I think Carolyn and Paul had some really good suggestions or yeah. things for you to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And and they're all reasonable things to that I think would enhance it. And I, I do want to actually point back to Michael just to say last Thursday this sort of back and forth and getting to this idea versus the other one. I think it 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 just takes it a little step. In, the, in, in a better direction. So I, I appreciate that kind of back and forth that we have. It's, it's helpful for me. So. All right. Any other comments from us? No. So, and do you oh, have I'm sorry. information from us? Yeah, so I mean, in general, uh, other than these, these adjustments, the, the general tenor is uh, positive, yeah? Okay, good. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a lot of things that are going to change, a lot of things that are going to be improved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Next concept plan is for 609 Fulton Street. The next case before you is uh, another renovation of a very small house, uh, 609 Fulton Street. It is located in the far southwest corner of the uh, local historic district and in the southwest corner of the uh, central Geneva historic district listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This is listed as a contributing building in both the local district and the National Register district. And, um, the house is somewhat familiar to you only because we've talked about it tangentially in relationship to the two homes on 6th Street that were renovated last year. Um, this is an area of, of Geneva that was known as Kastnerville, um, and this is the original home of the Kastner family that they bought in 1849 from the Riley family. So the house goes uh, way back. The house is shown in the 1869 bird's eye view of Geneva as a gable front home, so the uh, portion to the left it appears to be the original home. Um, uh, Sean Gallagher is the architect on this also, and I, he did uh, uh, get me access into the house, and the, the lumber under that portion of the house is vertically sawn lumber, which is, again, is consistent with the mid-1840s construction date. So I do believe that we are dealing with um, an 1849 um, core of a building. But therein lies the interesting part, as you know, from the history of the Kastners. The Kastners were scavengers and, um, and uh, house movers and, uh, and remodelers and built. So this house is a conglomeration of a lot of different architectural influences um, that has, has expanded to its present form today. So there is no one distinct or particular era, um, but rather this is a, um, a palette of multiple architectural uh, elements and forms and periods represented. Um, these are the two side views of the existing home. The uh, west elevation is slightly visible from the, um, uh, the, the street, and I bring that up because of some of the uh, requests that are being uh, brought forward for your, your input. Um, there is a rather large house that was built as an infill house very close uh, to the west side of this property. The east side, um, is a carport. It appears to be a garage from the street, but it's actually a carport. Um, it does have an overhead door, but it is otherwise a, a, a partially open structure. Um, it is built actually uh, in very close proximity to the east property line. So I mentioned in the staff report, and this is a critical part of the consideration of this evening's um, discussion, is the um, the carport is not structurally sound to have a second floor um, uh, put over with for habitable space. Also, the second floor can't be built out to the far eastern edge of the ex existing carport because it does not meet current zoning. There is also a small rear addition on the building um, that um, uh, was looked into, but again, it will not carry a second floor either because of the way the foundation was constructed. 
So um, the, the house, again, is a small home, and they are trying to maximize uh, the livability uh, of the home. Um, again, here is a small site. You can see it was carved out of a larger site. Um, the rear portion of this lot is part of the uh, homes to the, that are on 6th Street. And again, this is the area, again, that was Castorville, where they kind of did as they pleased for about 50 years here before Geneva kind of caught up with them and, and got down to this area. Uh, these are the existing uh, conditions. Uh, let uh, Sean explain a little bit further. Um, the existing floor plans um, and the proposed renovations. Um, uh, and I'll let Sean explain this more. And there's some alternates that he they're going to introduce for, for again, for your input and consideration because, again, this is a somewhat complex uh, project. I will identify a few things um, just briefly is there, um, you may want to have some discussion about uh, the treatment of the, the garage door. They've got, he has a couple suggestions, so I think he's looking for feedback. Um, there, the original front porch um, was closed in uh, probably at least 40 years ago. Um, it now has actual functional space. There's a powder room and an entryway in there, so it, the possibility of opening that up again is not very practical. Um, and um, then there are a couple options for how to treat the, uh, the, the west elevation to make the second floor more usable. Again, it's a very low uh, house. Sean's got these short little houses um, this, this month is his theme. And, uh, um, and then also uh, some suggestions of uh, trying to build out some storage space over the existing uh, carport, uh, which uh, storage space could be, um, could be built out uh, in accordance with zoning and um, the other considerations. So. Uh, I will, Sean's got a lot of detailed drawings here for the concept review. I will let him review that. Um, so at this point, I think it would be best if I sat down and let Sean Gallagher come up and explain this project. Oh, Gary uh, Wilson and Candace Phillips, I think, would like to speak. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. You need to go backwards or forwards. For okay. Slide. I won't use any of that. Good evening. My name is Gary Wilson. Uh, it's nice to be here this evening. Uh, my wife Candace and I are both really excited to be at this uh, point where we can uh, do the, have the uh, plans reviewed with you for concept review. Um, and we are on the uh, short house theme, as you can see. So that's why we're here. Uh, we have some, some limitations. But um, hopefully what you see from the picture is in the five and a half years that we have lived here in Geneva, we've put a lot of uh, time, effort, and resources into uh, bringing some beauty elements to the home. Um, we do that both for, um, for our joy of uh, creating a home, but also for our love for the community, uh, which has, uh, uh, you know, we, we had that initial love uh, five, six years ago coming and having a great lunch at Preservation. So we're really happy that Lawrence is here. And we kid him all the time that he has a lot to do with why we uh, decided to uh, make Geneva our home. Um, so now we find ourselves after five years of making improvements and um, you know, putting a new driveway in and uh, refurbishing the whole bottom uh, floor of the home, which includes a uh, kitchen from our neighbors, uh, the McFadden's, a past basket kitchen. So we feel like we've done as much as we can uh, with the beauty element, and now we really need to make the house more livable and have some more space in it um, so we can have family stay over with us in the <laughs> tiny, tiny bedrooms that are upstairs. So that what we would like to do is there are three very small bedrooms. Um, do some combination and expansion into two bedrooms uh, so we can have a little bit more livable space and some closets would be really nice. Um, <laughs> that's what we're up to. So. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll take questions. And, uh. So um, this project is interesting um, and we've, I've learned a little bit from the house next door um, this being Kastnerville. Um, this house, actually, we're planning on bringing, bringing the, or taking the shingle siding off and exposing the Dutch lap siding, which is, looks in pretty good condition. Uh, what's interesting about the house next door is that it has a very similar Dutch lap siding. 
and we believe it was part of the entire enclave of Kastner's. And so um, I happen to know the contractor on that project, so I reached out to him and found out that that house was built with siding and no sheathing. So um, we will be exposing the siding and likely be trying to restore that siding as best we can and then um, where necessary patch and replace um, probably half this house is the original siding and then other parts have probably been remodeled or removed and, and so we may find all kinds of different sheathings the castners are very creative um, some of the structure in the basement includes a wheel hub, I believe, that helps to hold up a steel wide flange on a pipe column that is, I don't know where they got it, it's enormous, um, mm -hmm. might have been from a rail yard somewhere, but uh, so a lot of interesting things with this house that we're hoping to uncover. Um, windows are a serious issue and, and if you had time to look through our proposal, you'll notice that we also included in there a fairly lengthy uh, proposal that was was to be submitted back when I used to be on the commission by uh, Mary uh, ben Bencini or ben Bencini, yeah. And so she had a gentleman by the name of Lou uh, Labuda uh, look at these back in 07. And, uh, oh, okay, <laughs> I thought I set it off. Um, uh, these windows are, are beyond repair, I'm afraid. Um, there is, uh, I'll just kind of run through the list. They're not original. Uh, in part, we know that because the pulley pockets have been filled. Uh, these are pin types, so they pin out. Um, we, uh, the windows are, have inoperable pins, which that can be fixed, but the, ra the rails and styles are separated and deformed. Uh, the mortising on this is open, and so a lot of water has gotten into these, the joinery. And so now what has happened is not only are the sashes racked, but then they're, they're twisted in the opening. So now you can't get the check rails to line up. And, and in fact, it's so skewed that you've got sort of a taper to one sash, versus the other so in, in just getting them to align is almost impossible without actually cutting these down in order to get them to do that um, so we are proposing um, replacement of some of these windows with wood double hung marvin windows um, and those are outlined in the proposal um, let's see if i can help illustrate those for you so as you look at the front elevation it's these two upstairs now these are actually in a bathroom now um, and in a new bathroom that's expanding. So the glass itself has to be changed, let alone the windows, because it has to be tempered glass because it's right adjacent to a bathtub. Below are these two windows here in the living room. Those two windows are, again, in the same family of deterioration as the others. Uh, so we're simply replacing them in the same size, the same opening. It's just replacement units. Um, the unit above here in the bedroom, that needs to be changed out because we're remodeling that bedroom. And once you start to remodel the bedroom, the deterioration alone is an issue. But by remodeling that bedroom, it triggers egress requirements. So that window itself is actually a, a mock double hung. So that is a wood window. That is a casement that looks like a double hung. And you've seen us do that in the past as well. Beyond that on the front, those are the windows that are being replaced. The existing front door and this little uh, window here in the powder room stays. We are, as Michael mentioned, changing out the garage door. Um, the garage door itself, I think there's a photograph of it now, has this sort of um, odd little angle to it. Um, so we will be replacing that, softening the curve to give it a, a little bit of character um, on that elevation. So here you see it here with it's sort of a compound arch. A garage door, it will be wood. Um, and then uh, as far as um, the addition, so you do see the addition off the side. Um, into the knee wall, we have about five feet of the existing house. So the idea here is to at least create a shed um, off the side of that. That is shown here. So here's an example of one of those. There's the shed there with uh, a pair of windows here and then a small window there. And then these new windows on the first floor replacing existing windows. Um, we do, we do show an option here, so one of the thoughts might be um, we could actually salvage the existing windows that are in the lower level and use those in the upper level. They're actually they're, uh, like French casements. And so one of the thoughts was, well, you know, those windows, those might be salvageable. So if we could, 
maybe we repurpose those for the master bedroom here and then the master closet. Uh, and then new windows here to, to gain more light um, into that living room. The living room occupies this entire area here on the first floor. So um, you do see a little bit of this elevation. As Michael mentioned, the house next door is, is quite tall and quite big next to it. So um, it sort of dwarfs this elevation. But we do need the head height in order to just simply get access to a little bit more of the edge of the, uh, the house. As Michael also mentioned, this piece here is just simply for storage. We're creating a little storage space as well as over the garage. Now the garage, we have two schemes and I think do we have those elevations in here, Michael? We must, right? Yes. There we go. So one scheme is to actually take the roof line a little higher. So here's the side of it from the neighboring property, from the McFadden's. Take that up a little higher so that we actually have some attic space here. Because if you look at the existing roof line, this is the existing roof line here. Okay. So we're looking at one option of extending that up a little higher. Um, in this option here, we're simply keeping it as is. Now, what's governing a decision on that is actually budget. We have a contractor looking at the numbers, and once we sort of get, once we marinate on those numbers, we can figure out exactly where uh, priority-wise. But we would like to at least put that in front of you, so if they decided based on the numbers it's, uh, it's something that you'd be okay with, we would like to go forward with it. So that's this one here. So you see a little bit of a dormer in there. We put a little peekaboo dormer in there. Um, and then this is the side from McFadden's. This is all sided um, to match. So any new siding we do will be a Dutch lap with the exposure to match the existing. So one, one question. Sure. Michael, the, the elevation with the options and, and the side view from, of the roof line, is, is that visible from the, the street or is it not? If you stand at a very particular point in the corners of the, of the sidewalk, you can see the side elevations barely. So it technically falls under our consideration, but again, that's one reason that, um, at, especially when this comes back in for permit, everybody should go out to the site and make an opinion for themselves um, because it's, it's, it's a very slim slice of the sides that you can see. Thank you. I, I would like to maybe just say that if if we went in for permit and you all went out there and said, well, it's an issue, I would sure like to know that now yeah. <laughs> versus then. You're right. So, um, but to that end, I, I, again, there's a very, it's a very small portion of this to see on both sides because the McF this house is only two feet off of the property line. I, in 86, they got a variance to do that, to do this little um, a carport. Uh, element. Um, the, the, the lot area is the smallest I've ever worked on. It's uh, 3,721 square feet of lot. So that last project you just saw was 3,300 square feet of just buildable area. Um, the lot, um, the building area that is allowed, so this is interesting. Um, again, because the lot is so small, it is smaller than any table value that the city has. So I had to have Paul Evans and David DeGroote run numbers on this. So the allowable building area for this one is, is in theory 2,329 square feet. The project you're looking at here is 1,350. So it's about 1,000 square feet less than what in theory is allowable here. Wow. So, and that includes some bonuses. For instance, there's a garage bonus. You get 484 square feet. So that's all factored into those numbers. So here you're doing about 1,000 square feet less than what's allowed on this site. So, and it's just simply a, a shed dormer off of that north side to try to get a little bit of floor area. We are doing a dormer off the back, but you really can't see that um, to help get more space into that second bedroom. So. One of the things Sean hasn't pointed out, but we have talked about um, is and I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you are still salvaging a majority of the historic roof and using structure to um, support yeah. that existing roof. So you might want to address yes, that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So any existing roof rafters are to remain, and any new structure is supposed to be sistered to the existing structure. I know we kind of ran into that with the Campbell Street Francis project. Here we're going to be maintaining um, as much of the original roof structure as possible. Uh, 
I could go first. I, Thank I, you. I don't. I don't really have a the 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 dormer on the west side. I I don't have a problem with that at all. That that I know it pops up through and oh. it'll be visible, but it doesn't. I think change much of the character of the house. Uh, the the roof over the existing over the garage this one here paul here yeah on that on the one up there yeah on the <coughs> option mm -hmm. i i think that changes mm -hmm. the character of the house yeah. considerably yeah and i and the scale of the house i i don't i'm not would you object to something a little smaller I wouldn't or just not change anything at all because no, again think, it's it's think, such a think, janky kind of I think the dormer is what throws me off one of the things that oh, throws okay. me off with it and then the height of it being mm -hmm. the yeah is, with is within considerable yeah. but <clears throat> I guess if you put the dormer off the back I wouldn't have a problem at all you know because the dormer seems to call says, attention to it yeah, yeah. it does it's just a roof surface interesting so you'd be comfortable with its height if there was no dormer there I, I still wanted a little less than that. I, I don't know how much less, but, you know, I know you didn't. Throw me a number. It's just something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, that's fine. I, I, uh, that's certainly <laughs> something. Uh, again, the, the height in there in terms of storage, you've got five and a half, maybe six feet of, yeah. of, to the ridge. Again, we're talking about a house that's so small that when you start to really get to the realities of it, the scale of the drawings kind of throws off. it looks like it's really high. Like yeah, maybe right. Maybe 15 feet. Yeah. Well, it, it's the mass of the house. Understood. Yeah. 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 Compared mm -hmm. to the mass of the. Sure, but I, 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 I'm sure we can work with that uh, in terms of tweaking its height, and then also the possibility of, of either adjusting the dormer size or maybe not even having one I at all. I so. think eliminating the yeah. dormer would okay. be the way to go, at least on the front side. Yeah, I agree. I think it calls too much attention to the carport. Yeah. Okay. Even though I don't. I mean, that, that carport was built in what year? 86, yeah. with a variance to get two feet from the property line. So, and you're talking about the round, the round dormer that's in the, the no, new I, I, no. garage? I'm talking about this, oh, that this dormer here. Yeah. That one there? Yeah. 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 The, the, round, the round dormer's in the back. That's these? the rear or, elevation, right? The, yeah, these, these back here. Yeah, they're, they're off the back. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why on the west elevation you have a little bit of the roof still hanging out there? This one, well, so I had a conversation a back and forth with Michael, and he said uh, the commission members would probably encourage us to try to maintain that line. And so, and would didn't I say? I have been wrong before with what you guys will say, just so for the record. So that, that was one of the... Which one? So carrying this... So this roof line actually sort of extends through. It's a, it would actually be an applied element because it's, it's not acting in any real capacity other than just mimicking the, run, the line running through. So. Okay. And, and these are the two versions of that west side that we're looking at again. Um, but Paul, to your point, um, I mean, I think not, this would be an appropriate place to not have it because we're, we're starting to fill more of the, yeah. the depth, yeah. right? Where, where they're so short up into here in the possible yeah. repurposing, well, maybe that works because they're, they're, they're tighter to that roof line. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, All right, if we're splitting hairs here, I, I don't think know, we are actually. I, I don't, I think I would eliminate it and not be, it, I know you'll be able to. I actually, I walk the dogs every day by this house. And I'd be able. To, I see that west elevation, mm -hmm. so it is visible from the. Mm -hmm. so if you built it that way, then would you? I would have a hard time. No, I would. <laughs> the dogs would have a problem. The with dogs it. would have a problem. With it. I don't want my dogs to have an issue. No, no. no. Um, can you talk a little about the? or the, the, the porch the canopy the canopy at the porch what? sure so right now there's a little awning structure you're familiar with it walking by there enough the, the idea here is just simply to carry a carry a fixed roof line 
that has brackets, not unlike the proposal you just saw now, but in this case, it's just simply a shed, slides out as a, uh, a copper standing seam element. It only slides out about 36 inches over the, the doorway, because again, in this case here, we have a, a similar situation as we have with the previous applicant where um, a lot of that snow sort of collects up on this roof line and then simply dumps down over the doorway, so. In fact, I do know that they have some issues with a little bit of settling along this edge where they've, um, they've had the brick pavers kind of dropping down in, so. To me, the roof, it, it really accentuates the front door so you know where, mm -hmm. you know where to go. Good. Is that all your comments? That's it for me. All right, who's next? Jim? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Looking, looking at um, the Fulton Street elevation, um, I, I can I can see what you're talking about doing with the garage. With the door. The yeah the the door on the garage and the where's the, where's the elevation that yeah okay. Um, do you have an elevation that shows the garage? without the additional space up above? Yep, it's this one. Where? Well, there's the roof line right there. Oh, I see, okay. And then there's the roof line there. Okay, yeah, the, the, the words are kind of in the right. way there, yeah. all right. The thing is that roof line is so low right now, it just, it, it looks really so compressed. It, okay. it makes the garage door look yeah. odd oddly scaled with that. I, I'm not quite sure why they did it the way they did, but they did a lot of things for reasons we don't know, so. But I, I, I agree with Paul that the garage, or will it be in a garage or will it still be a carport? No, it will be a, it'll be a garage. So we're gonna actually have to do fire rated drywall on the inside face, and then we're gonna enclose the side because again, they've, the weather gets in there. Right. So okay. that's why we're showing siding on this side versus okay. the the lattice that's on there now. Okay. All right, so then we will call it a garage. Um, I agree with Paul that it appears that the new roof seems to be too tall for the scale of the house. Okay. But I can understand that they would like a little more room to put Christmas decorations, et cetera, up on the top there. So can you find a compromise between the tall roof yes. and the real short roof? Yep, I can and I will. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the dormer and the and a long way yeah. to, uh, and illuminate the dormer, at least from the front facade. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and the shed dormer uh, up on the second floor. Um, how far? Um, it's about a foot and a half push back from the front elevation. Okay. And is it also <clears throat> is it also a put a, a push back for a foot and a half from the back elevation? No, structurally that's not. Oh, from the back elevation. Back elevation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, so it's essentially centered. So uh, actually, looking at the west elevation here, mm -hmm. it's centered so that we can actually then get create center lines for windows below over the, the living room and that sort of thing. So it's, it's at least balanced in that elevation end to end. Okay. I, I do like the west elevation where you are repurposing the windows. Okay. That were for, from downstairs from below. I, I, I do prefer myself that mm -hmm. because of course I'm always interested in reusing of course. Uh, original elements. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's all that I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, other comments? Uh -huh. Before you before you leave this, just because Sean mentioned, I don't think I got that far on the slides. If you want to go through the windows briefly, they're at the very end, the windows and the siding, um, just to give you an idea yeah. of um, what you're what you're looking at, so you have an idea to, of what he's asking yeah. for conceptually. Yeah. Um, just one interesting little tidbit here, and I know we're holding up everybody else, so I don't want to, but this is really weird. Um, what they did was they actually applied the trim board over the face of the Dutch lap siding. Usually, you want that to to die into the face of your trim. So, so, and this is a telltale detail that is similar to the house next door. Mm -hmm. so, so that leads me to believe that this is actually siding on the actual raw studs. Um, so this is, this is this, actually it's in really quite 
decent condition for this little section of it. This is a back corner, um, and so um, you know we're praying that that everything else is uh, in this condition as well. There will be some patching. There's a every one of these is a it's two shingles, mm -hmm. one under and then another over it. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's four nails in every one of these. So that's a lot of nails in those walls. Um, and then the windows here again. Uh, you can definitely, yeah, I mean, it's just, now you've got grain wicking up, the the tenon and uh, uh, it's just gone. Um, in fact, uh, they have, right now they have sticks. If you read the description from uh, Miss Bensini, she has the whole thing kind of scripted out for you. But here's where you see the gaps between sash and sill, but then it even, oh, well, and it, it gets even worse on the check rail, so we don't have any images there of that, but, um, but anyway. So then Mary Bensini did not, replace the windows she did not she did nothing the application just sort of sat there i don't know if it never showed up in front of us at that time but um, whether it was financial issues or just kind of life issues she didn't go forward with anything so okay. yeah All right. and to me that i mean this should be this should be noted that she actually did an analysis and put yeah. numbers together and showed photos and all of this stuff and um, put together a good proof that yeah. these are not salvageable. I guess from my end, as I stand here, I wonder what is the threshold of, I mean, as you start to look at these things, I, this was a problem for me when I was on the board too, is what is the, what is the dollar amount that makes that mm -hmm. threshold? I mean, is it a percentage? I mean, how do you guys end up coming up with that? I'm not asking for an answer, but I'm just saying my, my hat goes off to you for the heaven. That's what the city council is looking for. Is yeah. it I'll bet. this or that? Yeah. 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 They're looking for a hard, I'm fast sure. number, right? Yeah. yeah I'm just yeah. not sure actual number is so or did we give him enough direction and I think so he knows where to go yeah. all right thank you so thank you for your service <laughs> you're welcome thank you for your leadership <laughs> and thank you for sticking it out for almost 25 years yep Yep. Oh, yeah. Couldn't make it all the way to September. I know, but <laughs> it's 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 been an honor to serve under you, and it's been an honor to present work to you. So thank you, thank you. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just say thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> all right. The next concept review is for 307 to 309 West State Street. This is a third concept review this evening for an exterior storefront rehabilitation. This uh, project is uh, in the North Geneva Historic District listed in the National Register of Historic Places and approximately at the center of the local Geneva Historic District. This is identified as a contributing building in both the local district and in the um, National Register District. Uh, the project is um, uh, known to all of you uh, because it is uh, prominently located on State Street. Um, it was built in 1909 uh, for George Kendall. It was built as a dual storefront uh, uh, building with a grocery on one side and a dry goods store on the other. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a rather um, uh, one of our unique earlier one-story commercial buildings. There, there was quite a bit of press um, on, on this when it was built. Uh, this is a Wilson Brothers building. Uh, this is actually one of the first commercial buildings the Wilson Brothers built. They established their firm in Geneva about 1906, uh, 1905, 1906, and started building um, primarily residences. And they developed a, a, a reputation of doing quality work, and so then were in quite uh, large demand for both residential and commercial, as well as some industrial uh, construction in Geneva. The interesting thing about the, uh, um, the building was that George Kendall added onto it within one year. Um, the addition is to the uh, right or to the east. It's not part of this proposal, although it will show up in the rendering, so I just wanted to identify that, that um, an addition was put on for a restaurant and waiting room for the, um, uh, uh, the, the streetcar line through, through Geneva. This is a 1909 view of uh, State Street. Uh, it's a little bit different 
than what you see today. Um, the building on the right is the former Air Days building that was enlarged by 10 feet to the east and then put it, given a new storefront in 1924, just to give you your, your bearings. And so then the three uh, storefronts um, uh, in between the two-story buildings um, are the Kendall buildings. The um, building that is identified as the uh, Aurora, Elgin, and uh, Chicago Railroad uh, uh, waiting room um, is, the, is the current Nobel House, just to give you your bearings. And then the next two buildings to the left, or the next two storefronts to the left, are um, the current proposal to expand the Nobel House into those um, spaces. Uh, the building on the far left is the building that many of you know now today is the Turquoise Building. Mm -hmm. um, just again, just to get your bearings on State Street because so, the street does look so a little Michael, differently. you're saying that all three storefronts are the original building? The two left are the original building, 1909. The, the right bay is the 1910, 1910 edition. 1910 edition. All right. by George Kendall. So we're talking 1909-1910 for all three. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So again, just uh, some approximate views of the building from uh, somewhat of the same vantage point. One of the things that we uh, have discussed on this commission, other people have brought up to me since I've been here, is that um, the, the western half is up, is the brick has been painted, uh, which does go against our design guidelines. The other uh, half of the storefront is um, of the 1909 building is the original brick um, that is, is very dirty um, and um, um, is, is much darker than it would have been in 1909. Um, the western portion retains its original storefront um, uh, from 1909, um, although the, the lower date or bulkhead has been replaced with a granite or, or uh, composite stone uh, of some sort, the rest of the storefront remains intact, um, including the storefront windows, the transom windows, and um, one of the cast iron pilasters. We don't know if the other cast iron pilaster survives under the remodeling that was done for Fox's jewelry. This is the existing condition, so again, this shows the dual entrance, uh, the, uh, even though this has a central um, a pediment piece that identifies as the 1909 Kendall building, it was designed as a dual um, uh, building. It served as lots of different things after the dry goods and grocery store, including a theater and confectionery um, in the, in the right-hand bay of this building. So it has served as a dual entrance building um, for the majority of its life. Uh, this is the proposal for Nobel House. Um, again, they're proposing a new storefront um, that would put in a centralized entrance and also would um, have operable uh, opening windows that look somewhat like a casement window. If you're familiar with their, their current uh, window arrangement at Nobel House, it would be something on that order. Um, and, uh, and be a new storefront on the, on the lower level, again, with the central entry. And it's also showing that the, um, uh, the facade would be painted out uh, in a uniform color. The, um, the issue of signage is not a, a, an issue before the commission. That would be handled under a separate permit, and that's an administrative review. Uh, so the uh, uh, discussions about the signage really aren't uh, uh, pertinent. And then you can see the proposal to repurpose the current Nobel House um, in, in a similar fashion uh, uh, to, to the proposed remodeling of the storefront. Um, so again, the architectural drawing. Um, the architectural drawing uh, shows the elevation as well as the section uh, in the upper right showing again the replacement of the uh, entire storefront with a, um, a framed system with, with the movable glass uh, partition or movable glass exterior windows in the, in the, in the facade. So at that, that's uh, my introduction to the project. At this time, I know there are representatives here, but I did not get a chance to meet them. Dave? Dave? This is Mark Mason. So this will take you back. This okay. will take you forward. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm, uh, my name is Jason Levin. I'm one of the uh, owners of Nobel House along with Dave Cilio behind me. And then we also have Andy Mammon with us who's with uh, Haven Design Studio. So, um, so Michael did a great job to laying out what we're trying to do. Um, we want to, uh, we opened Nobel House uh, about four and a half years ago. Um, things have gone great. Uh, we all, all of us are residents of the town as well, and um, Dave and I had owned some restaurants in the city and wanted to do something here in Geneva, and we couldn't be happier the way it's turned out. I think the restaurant scene in this town is fantastic, and we're looking to uh, invest more resources into doing more here. So 
The idea was to move Nobel into the other uh, two locations and then to do another new concept in the current Nobel place. So, I, oh, wrong way. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> so, as you mentioned, this is the rendering that we are looking at. So, as Michael mentioned, we, want, we would like to centralize the, the entrances. That will become um, the Nobel House and be one location. Um, and we do want the operable windows, similar to what we have today at Nobel. Um, but other than that, we really want to keep the integrity of the way the buildings are today. Um, and, you know, in addition to the uniform look that uh, Michael had mentioned as well. Um, we feel like this improves these three storefronts. Um, you know, we're excited with what we've conceived at the moment. We're very early in these stages. We want to get some feedback before we move forward to understand, you know, what we are able to do and what we can do and what we should do next. So anybody has any questions or comments? Our architect is Alex Teibel, who is not able to make it tonight. So if it gets real technical, <laughs> you, we'll, we'll have him call you later. <laughs> All right, who wants to open up? I think, I think when I look at this, there's, there's two things that bother me to start with. One is um, losing the original historic entryway and, uh, um, that I think was on the left-hand side. There were a pair. Had them left and right. <clears throat> left and right. <clears throat> but the left was... The left is intact. The, the right storefront has been remodeled. Has been, re had been redone. It still has the central entry to that unit, but it's been remodeled. Right, got it. Um, and I think this, the second thing, the, <clears throat> the, the emblem in the middle, I know on that brick there is some, some architectural elements, some, some character mm -hmm. to that brick. And covering that up, I, I okay. concerns me. I, I have a... I have a concern with that. Um, if we look to accomplish that same look with an awning or something that would get the face of the brick clear, that would be sure. answer that type of problem. Sure. Yeah. Some we could certainly And I think the way this, the sign, and I know we're not talking about signing, but on the other side, on the, on the two sides, you know, it's, it, it, it appears like it is not going to cover that up. Like it's within the, the areas where that brick is is yeah. the character is so I'm, I have no problem with that it was it was just that just the logo in the middle okay so what do you think about the storefront portion of it I mean my 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 gut tells me I'd like maybe to keep like it is. maybe it's an off-center entrance or or mm -hmm. something I, I don't know that I have a great solution um, the reasoning for the center door is just I mean, right now over the four years we've been kind of limited on seating capacity and sure. to maximize our occupancy is in the flow. Right now it is preliminary renderings and drawings but the layout of the uh, business will dictate on where the door is located but for in order for us to maximize our seating the center door made the most sense. Just, just a reminder, when you do speak, could you please introduce yourself because we are recording. Uh, my name is Dave Cilio. I'm Jason's business partner. Great. Uh, Thank you. Local resident as well. I, I guess I, I just, you know, fall back to reusing and, and refurbishing mm -hmm. as opposed to replacing. And, and yeah, I, I, I would echo that also. I, I agree that it, uh, the, the biggest well, there's a couple issues I have with it. Uh, the existing storefront, if we could, if that can be salvaged, that would be the best. And mm -hmm. it really, it it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be an entrance or a door at that point. But it could be just a panel that looked like a door. Right. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. And and I, I'm not sure that, I don't know whether the existing center portion maybe you know Michael whether that existing center panel is a is that original storefront also between the two cast iron 
pilasters there? Yeah. Uh, under, the, under the center of pediment? Under the center of the pediment. It appears from the historic photograph that that was always a display window. Okay. When, when blowing up the two, three or four uh, images from the Geneva History Museum, um, it appears it's always been a display window. Okay. Yeah. I, got, I got a question on the brick. <clears throat> what is the possibility of, you know, because you got the, the, the you got a good portion of it and an architectural element over the top that's still in the natural brick face. Mm -hmm. You know, what would be the idea of possibly getting the paint off mm -hmm. the other side and then cleaning it, still having the ability of putting your signage mm -hmm. the way you have in there, but instead of having it white, you have the nat the, the restored architectural brick and everything that's already been original because a lot of it is already exposed. It's just you know, one kind of panel over there that would be on to the left-hand side. Wouldn't um, taking that paint off the pink side, that's going to be very difficult, isn't it? I mean, Paint removal has come a long way as far as removing off a of brick. Um, the, the only way to answer that question would be to do a sampling of it because, again, I don't know how many coats of paint are on there. I don't know what they painted it with. Um, but the, the ability to remove paint even off of a raked brick or a surfaced brick uh, has become a lot uh, easier in the last few years with some of the technology that's out there. So um, one of the things in our design guidelines um, that, that are adopted by the city is to um, not paint <coughs> masonry that was um, originally exposed masonry. So that could be a request or, or a suggestion at this point um, to consider. Um, the um, brick on the east half, if you remove the paint from the west half, you'd have to, of course, clean the uh, east half as well because you will be cleaning the brick as you remove the paint. I, I the, think paint the paint hasn't been there that long. I, I've been on the commission five years, and it was right before Carla Coffers left us that the, that the building was painted. So that's only about four and a half years ago. I also think, too, is that when you look at that, okay, perfectly right there, you got that top element along there, mm -hmm. you know, and of, of it right in the middle, it says Kendall 1909, which would be painted over in this new facade. No, that would not, actually. But, I mean, you would, you would lose the ability really to see it. Right. Well, our intention is not to take anything away from the decorative and art architectural design of the building. We want to keep that Kendall. We love the story and the history behind the building, the decorative brick around. We were going to in integrate our signage. I understand the concern that you share with the, the Nobel mm -hmm. face. If you're familiar with our business now, that's Alfred Nobel. So with it being Swedish days, he has some Swedish that's true. history. So there's a love story between Alfred Nobel and Sophie. So with them looking at each other is kind of a, a story in itself. She was a, a, a lady that works in a local market bakery, and that center building at one point, the 307 property, was a bakery. So we're trying to continue the story of the history of, of Geneva and, and the businesses that were in these properties at the time, bringing Sophie's and a new concept to us in the existing Noble House. So that's kind of the angle that we're going with, but with them facing each other again was kind of love story, but we could shrink his head and, and, and make it work and, and work with the new logo, or, or at least the signage. I, I, I guess the only suggestion I would throw out there is to at least try to see what would it take to remove the <laughs> lovely pink paint and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and clean, you know, clean up all the other, you know, the original brick, but still you being it for you be able to utilize those natural frames right. on each side, which would actually, I think, probably it's a natural give, border, and that's right. where we wanted to put our, our and, sign. And I think yeah. rather than painting it, I think if you had the, the natural 1909 brick face yeah. there, it would really work to well, kind of, you know, play into that, you know, older theme that you're looking for between. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly explore that. Yeah. I think it's worth exploring, yeah. and as Carolyn said, is that we don't think the paint's been up there that long, so actually taking it off may be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. I think the original brick would look great so we can, if we can make it work. And I guess what I would say is, you know, I, I like your story. I like what you're saying, and, and uh, you know, I like that, but I don't see that here. Mm -hmm. I see 
you put a whole new storefront on it and you know, you're keeping some brick framework toward the top but you know we've we've really got three distinct buildings or facades and um, so you tell this great story about the bakery in the middle and you know all of this stuff and then I look at this and I I lost it I, I, did, I didn't get your story anymore and so I me I don't I don't particularly have a problem with you painting it because you've got the pink paint already and you know so maybe maybe the paint is a unifying item but um, I just I'd love to just see the structure on the on the first floor somehow try to retain that where is that I would say go ahead and paint but keep the structure someone else on the commission might say something structure on the 309 so the left the far west property well so it, so it still looks like it's three like three buildings. different buildings yeah so but even if we, if we came up with a design element similar to what we talked about a little earlier that gave us that appearance but maybe that's not actually a door right. but that's yeah, something that yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm a little concerned too that of the the operable windows in the storefront but if if there's a way to salvage the storefront and still work with the frame that's there and and insert a panel into that yeah. I wouldn't have a problem with that either I, that that would be the way I would want to drive it and then you know unify the just like you have here unify the the sill level of the storefront yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and you know it but salvaging one of them as an entrance i think is it would be a really yeah. good way to if your architect well, can work so that out one of the things i, I want to bring to everybody's attention i did talk about this with dave was this was um, submitted at first as a permit um, drawing and the reason it's coming to you as a concept is because we haven't seen an interior plan yet and the building department was uneasy with us approving a storefront without uh, seeing the full set of plans to see how exiting was going to work and so um, that is one thing that you'll have to work through was as you I don't know where you are in your interiors yeah. but the building department um, was not comfortable with this coming as a permit yet until they saw an interior plan to make sure exiting was met so it may be depending on how the plan evolves that both doors may be required uh, for right. exiting or maybe not. Um, again, I know nothing about your interior, sure. um, but that's why this is coming to you as a concept <coughs> at this point. Yeah, I was thinking kind of the same thing is that you've got, if you're getting rid of one of these doors, how mm -hmm. can you get out? There'll be mm -hmm. rear entrance. Yeah. Again, another reason this moving it to the west gives us an opportunity to mm -hmm. um, put a large patio on the back. Yeah. So an outdoor, out outdoor seating opportunity. So I just so I understand, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly. It's not the the operable windows that they you like to just see it within the same framework. I'd like to see to it in the, in the existing framework, especially on the west the west half of it. I don't have a problem replacing the east half of it to be since it's already been replaced. If you could bring it back to look like the west half, that'd be great. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Does that give you a direction? It does. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, now, on, on the other hand, I have a different point of view. Okay. Uh -oh. Good um, I was very pleased to see that the 309 store facade is as original as it is. And I think it would really be unfortunate if that wasn't kept in its, uh, as it is, that it, that it would be it would be um, renovated and improved, but that its format uh, would be as, as it is now. Its, its shape would be as it is. The doorway would be as it is. Um, <clears throat> and I do understand what you, what you are trying to do. I wonder if you have considered since and this is new to me that all three of these storefronts were one building uh, as of 1910. I wonder if you could stay in Noble House as you are and extend and expand into 307 and leave 309 out of your situation or use 309 in a different way uh, but renovate it so that we can see how it, how it looked back in 1909 when it was built so that that was actually our original thought process so we are occupying all 
three storefronts as this. So we have the Sophie's concept that will be coming in. Um, there are many reasons why this way makes more sense from a financial perspective, from a layout perspective. The fact that the storefronts are so different at Nobella, where Nobella is, and the uh, 305 and 307 are, mm -hmm. it would just take a lot to make that work as one unit sure. versus the two units that seem to be originally together. Right. You know, there's a lot of synergies already that already exist mm -hmm. that don't have to be recreated if we did it the other way. So that's why we opted for that. But it's funny to say that because that was actually our original thought process. But um, we do feel maybe with some of these, you know, can, some of these um, suggestions that that would be easier to maintain the integrity of the buildings, what we're suggesting now versus our original thought. So. I see. I see. Well, since the, the, the facade on the Noble House as it is right now uh, has, been, has been dramatically changed as time has gone on, and the one where uh, the jeweler used to be, that was dramatically, well, not maybe as dramatically changed, but was definitely changed considerably probably in the 50s. There's not a whole lot historic left there for you to have to deal with with those <laughs> parts of the building, whereas where doggy divine is now that that there's a, a lot there that you would need to deal with i believe in a way where uh the building would be restored to the way it looked uh back in 1909 mm -hmm. Th that that's my thinking okay. that one has that has a lot of integrity it would be a shame to see that integrity disappear mm -hmm. and if that looking at it from my point of view if that part of the building is restored to its 1909 condition, how will that how will that blend with the other part of the of the building that you have in mind? That doesn't seem to me that there's a way to blend them so that they look like they belong together. When you say the other building, do you mean 305 or the or or 307? 307. 307. I and unless, I've, unless you turn 307 into the way it looked back in 1909. I, I guess where I'm maybe confused, I feel like 307, 309 are closer to that than, say, 305 and 307 would be. I think there would be a lot of work and a lot of changes to make that work together. We're like, I mean, I, I don't think that, I, I'm guessing that we're not saying 307, do whatever you want because that's what would require to make that work with 305, I yeah. feel like. Yeah. And I feel like that would be more of a dramatic change to that block than, than this. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm explaining that correctly. I just, to me, it's, when I look at that, I feel like the 307, 309 seem to be an easier fit. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and to me it looks, organizationally it looks like that could be one unit it was one built unit. i mean it, it was a, built yeah it was one building yeah. but with two right. and there was a, a party wall or whatever right. a, a gentleman divided the two buildings right so i like so. that you're able to do that and yeah and basements are actually connected too yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay and actually i just want to clarify i i would want you to sell keep and renovate the existing uh, is it 309 is the most farthest west? Correct, yes. Okay. I would want you to keep and salvage the storefront. Mm -hmm. It's just whether you can, you know, I, I don't know whether the glass is original or not. I mean, can you tell that, Michael? Or I couldn't tell a date for sure, but it's, it's 20th century glass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the wood framing around it? No, there's a, it's a metal frame, it's right? It's aluminum clad, I believe. It, it, it's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, the, the, the 1909 is a wood framed storefront. Okay. Um, there are cast iron pilasters at the, at the, bear, um, bearing the way to the center. And then the, uh, Fox's jewelry space is a aluminum storefront. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So if we maintain the door at the 309 property, mm -hmm. where it is in the window lines and the window height and width mm -hmm. and continue that line across for the symmetrical portion into the 305 would we be good with that 307 i'm sorry no 307 excuse me yes yeah. 307 yeah. <laughs> yeah 
I think that's, that's what, what I would back That's what you, you want to maintain that. So yes. we're okay because that, if you looked to, so the Nobel building portion of it on the, yeah. on the left, mm -hmm. that window height is the existing window height. Sure. And if we were going to carry that line across, but if we move that center door to the left into the 309 property and keep the one that's there now, maintain, keep the, yes, maintain, maintain, maintain it. it. Yeah. Sorry. Maintain yeah. that, yes. yeah, the, the and doorway. Then would we have approval to modify the 307 doorway at all or with its changed so many times over the course of its history? Because I think looking through a couple of the historic photos that I saw with Jessica, that, like when it was a, a theater, I believe it was a left or a right entry. Now it's a center door entry. So that doorway has moved a few times in the course of its existence. The, the way our design guidelines work is um, that storefront could be returned back to something based on photographic evidence, and there are several different storefronts that have been in there. Mm -hmm. So if, if the commission concurred with whatever area you want to return to, that would be within our design guidelines. Our, the major uh, point of our design guidelines is to retain historic um, entryways. Um, so whether or not uh, you kept the pattern of the entryway, and, and but the glass was brought to the front, but you kept that same kind of rhythm, mm -hmm. that would be one solution. Another would be to, again, keep the uh, glass line and go back to, say, that 1930s uh, theater uh, uh, storefront, as long as there's some photo documentation. What the commission hasn't really approved and what our design guides don't allow for is to have a conjectural storefront that never existed but looks old. <clears throat> we wouldn't want that. That's what we call false historicism here. So we wouldn't want something just to be artificially designed right. that works really well for you but yeah. doesn't look anything like was ever there at any point in the building's history. Okay. Did you get enough information from us? I think so. Yeah, we'll go back to the drawing board with that that advice and see what we it, can come up it with. It might make sense to come back again before you decide to do a permit. Okay. To do the yeah. permit drawings. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to go on to building permit applications. First one is 528 Fulton Street. It is 10 minutes to 9, just so you're aware. Is there a need for a break before we start the permit drawing reviews? Hearing none, I will I'm proceed then. On. I'm good. This is just our ploy to keep you as long as we can, Scott. We're going to make it memorable. The uh, next case before you is a permit review case. It is coming to you, well, first of all, the building is located in the southwest corner of the um, historic district. And I'm going to be, I almost forgot this evening, I'm so used to doing this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn this case over to uh, our uh, community development intern, Jackie Narvarez, who is going to uh, introduce this case and um, bring this forward. <laughs> let you know we can be a lot rougher than we've been so <laughs> no. okay. we've just been beaten down a little bit no thank you for almost forgetting michael but i'm here <laughs> um okay so just want to get on with the quick facts about the case this is for 528 fulton street um and this is a permit review for a proposed front yard sidewalk replacement um, and as you can see on the map, it is a significant building in the southwest corner of the local historic district. And it is also a contributing building in the central Geneva historic district and is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so this is the house as outlined uh, by the box. So per the building permit matrix, a material change um, in the front yard is required to go before the HPC, so that is why it is here before you today. Um, so you can see as outlined by the boxes, that is the existing concrete walkway to be replaced, and the existing paver units um, would be matching where the concrete is now, so that would match. Um, and the red circle above there shows the walkway that would be placed, would be replaced and here are some pictures closing up the um, that show how it has cracked and kind of deteriorated over time and um, here are some of the samples of the proposed paver units that would replace that concrete 
And again, that would be matching that, uh, that side walkway be proposed. Okay, um, so now I'd like to introduce one of the applicants, Ann Fleming, to um, answer any questions that the commission might have at this time. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ann, and um, uh, Al couldn't be here today, so um, this is actually one of my first times being at the commission, so it's been an interesting <laughs> meeting. I've seen a little bit of, of everything here. So. <laughs> They're kind of easy. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, yeah, the sidewalk has, um, uh, we just wanted to kind of clean it up a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, it's got, you could see that uh, little hole. Um, there that uh, kind of catches the mailman's shoe every once in a while. So we <laughs> just thought maybe it'd be nice to fix that if for no other reason to help him out. And um, anyway, so the, I'm open to any questions if anybody has any. My contention is it's easy to take out. If someone right. buys his house later on, they can put a exactly. concrete And it's matching there. existing pavers as it is. Yeah, yeah right, so. right. And that should, that should work really well. Any other comments? Nope. nope. Right, can we have a motion to approve? Okay. Right. Motion to approve uh, 528 Fulton Street as presented. Can I have a second? Second. Who's taking roll call? Okay. Hamilton? Aye. Zellmer? Aye. Salomon? Aye. Zinke? Aye. Roy? Hi. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks thank you for you coming. Uh, next item is easy. 112 South 2nd Street. One Twelve South Second Street is a proposal to replace porch decking with a composite material. Uh, this is for the uh, Pioneer House, which is part of the Unitarian Universalist uh, Society of Geneva's property at uh, 2nd Street. It is in the South Geneva Historic District um, as a significant property, um, uh, and the South Geneva Historic District is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It is also listed as a significant building in the local Geneva Historic District. The building is an excellent example of the Queen Anne sti and Six styles. Um, has been meticulously maintained uh, by the society and uh, has been converted to administrative offices. It did serve originally as the parsonage um, for the church. And uh, just as an interesting fact, uh, the first resident was a female minister. Um, and uh, um, that's just kind of those little fun facts. So um, what is being proposed is to replace the three uh, his, uh, wood porch decking at the three uh, porches. All three porches are visible from the public right-of-way. So there are two at the front of the house, one on the uh, uh, northeast corner, one on the southeast corner, and then there is a rear deck that is visible um, across the lawn of the Patton House um, that is at the far uh, southwest corner of the building. We have looked at composite decking in the past, so you're very familiar with the product. I do have a sample here to pass around if you want to see this particular brand. This is one that hasn't come before you, but is very much like all the other uh, PVC uh, uh, decking products that have come before you. So the proposal is, as I said, to uh, replace the decking at these three porches. The plans call for that you got in, that you received in your um, packet uh, calls for the porch posts and the balustrades to remain. It would just simply be re uh, replacing the horizontal surface or the walking surface of the decks. Um, with that um, said, that is the um, extent of my introduction. I would like to turn this over to. Ron is going to introduce himself and uh, answer any of your questions and elaborate on the proj project. Thank you. This will take you back. This will take you forward. All right. Um, my name is Ron Craig. I am a member of the Unitarian Congregation um, and on the building committee. Okay. And this, this house being one of our responsibilities along with the entirety of the property. Um, the three porches mentioned were having an issue with the decking pretty much deteriorating and sponging. Obviously, it's a weather issue as well as we think it might be salt that 
just contributing to the deterioration of this material. So our proposal is that we redeck the three porches using the coma material. Um, and the reason that we kind of came up with this material is the section of the decking is exactly what we have on the building right now. The color is, is fairly close. The color on the existing material is, is a blue. This is a lighter blue, mm -hmm. not an exact match, but uh, um, we feel that it maintains the integrity of, of, of the residents. Sure. Great. And that's our okay. What proposal. comments do we have? Do we know when the porches, the existing material, when they were built? I have no idea when that decking material was installed uh, onto the residence. <coughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I guess that, it was. I, I think I could probably find that out if that was if that was necessary like, for the I process. Guess, you know, if it's of the period of significance, is it something that would we would prefer be try <coughs> be repaired or refurbished as opposed to being replaced? Hi, my name's Kevin O'Neill. I'm part of the facilities committee as well. Uh, I can't imagine this being anything original. Uh, it certainly is, is uh, what, pressed, uh, pressed board? Oh, pressed oh. board. Yeah, it's pressed board. Mm -hmm. It Because it's uh, <clears throat> basically coming out as sawdust right now. The, oh, the, okay. the, so the top has worn through and it's just turning into sawdust. So, so it's not, it's, it's pressed board. So it's not tongue and groove, and it's not a solid. No, board. it is. It's tongue and groove material. In fact, the section of this mimics almost exactly the material that's I on see. there now. I, see. Okay. I wasn't aware that it was press board. Well, it, that's my impression. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Given the way it's, it's behaving. I mean, I think it's definitely a solution, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I like that you're keeping the the posts and everything wood, you know, yeah. regular wood. So. I think I would be fine with it. And it's just the flooring you're replacing. That's correct. Okay. Are you replacing the treads, the right, the treads on yeah, the steps will, as well? Yeah, we will. We will replace all the treads, and that is that is the same material which is on the deck. So okay. it's basically just a demo reinstall <laughs> in the same configuration mm -hmm. okay. as is on there now. Okay. Two other comments. It is removable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it can be taken out later, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. It is more visible than than we'd like. Yeah. Than we'd like. I mean, that that's the one thing. Although How from long? the street, it really, you know, it really isn't all that visible from the street. When when you walk up the sidewalk <laughs> and you walk onto it, of course, you'll notice that it's not old-fashioned um, or original porch flooring but I th I think it's I, th I think it's okay all right so we have a motion um, okay I move that we um, that we approve the proposed porch decking replacement uh, at 112 South 2nd Street Can I have a second second Hamilton? Aye. Selmer? Aye. Salomon? Aye. Zinke? Aye. Roy? Aye. All right, thank you very much. All right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. All right, our next building permit is for 207 South 5th Street. <laughs> 207 South 5th Street is a proposed change of material, roof material, for a house that's located in the south portion of the local historic district and is also uh, a contributing building, a significant building, I'm sorry, in the, it's a significant building in the local district and a contributing building in the South Geneva or the Central, I'm not gonna start over. <laughs> <laughs> 207 South 5th Street is a proposed change of roof material for a significant house in the local Geneva Historic District and a contributing house in the um, 
Central Geneva Historic District listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Oh, I got through that finally. Um, this is coming before you because a, uh, a change of roof materials is required under the building permit matrix to come before the commission for approval. Um, this is a um, uh, significant home that has was restored in the 1980s, and as part of that restoration, um, uh, the roof was reshingled with a resawn wood shingle roof that would have been typical of the uh, early 19th century. Um, the roof is now uh, some 30 years old, which is a long time for a cedar roof in uh, in, in in our modern era. Um, and so the request is coming forward to replace it with a dimensional asphalt shingle roof that would replicate uh, the wood shingles. So again, because this is a change from wood to dimensional asphalt, um, this is coming before you for approval. Um, at this point, I would uh, invite Marty Stockhausen, who is the new owner of the home, to come forward to um, uh, answer any questions or explain any other parts of the project. I will say that uh, um, you saw in the proposal this is also including new stru uh, structural sheathing um, beneath the, uh, uh, the wood shingles um, as well. So um, with that, Marty, if you'd like to come forward and add anything, you're welcome to. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marty Stockhausen. Um, I have just uh, recently acquired this property at 207 South Fifth Street. Um, upon our home inspection, uh, it was determined that the existing roof uh, is uh, no longer um, usable. Uh, it's past its life. And as such, um, we need to replace the roof, basically, to maintain the overall structure of the existing home. Um, at this time, are there any questions for me? I don't know, it's kind of a new process for me, so. So what was your decision-making process to, uh, um, re instead of redoing the wood, doing the asphalt? Uh, twofold. Uh, one, the, uh, the shingles that were proposed by our roofer uh, last longer. Um, especially in, under conditions where the home is with all the uh, large foliage and everything sure. um, that would help keep the roof the way it is. We did look into trying to preserve the existing shingles that were on there. We had a restoration company come out and take a look at it. Uh, and they said because of the condition that is beyond repair mm -hmm. and beyond saving, yeah. um, if they tried to power wash it and stain it, it would just fall apart. So. All right. What comments do we have? Well, do we have any samples or any pictures of what this new roofing would look like on a roof? There are. It is, again, a standard dimensional asphalt shingle roof, so you've approved dimensional roofs um, many times here. But this is the brochure. I need it back. Do we know what was on the roof before 1984? No, I did look at the aerial photographs, but again, because of the mature trees, it was really almost impossible to see any kind of detail. I'm assuming, and assuming that uh, because the house is restored, and there was a, there was a couple, there were a couple of write-ups that I saw about the house being restored in the early 1980s. Um, that it probably did not have the wood shingle roof. It probably had an asphalt, probably a three tab. Uh, shingle roof. It seems like the house was um, treated fairly casually in its, its repair prior to this uh, 1980s restoration. Thank you. All right, other comments? I understand that that uh, existing roof is not salvageable, and it mm -hmm. looks like it was put on um, from a period that is not significant historically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess I'm okay with the shingles. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I understand the replacement. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling a little with not replacing it with the wood. With the wood. Um, See, typically you would replace like 
Right. Yeah. But if this was in 86, but they put the wood on there, then it, placing it with what was put well, in on 86. And, and to the point that was raised, you know, we don't know what was on it before. Right. The wood. In this period, it very well could have been wood shingle later than covered with uh, a flat seam or a stained seam metal roof. Those were all very inexpensive. We see houses in the Sanborn maps with both those types of roofs on them. Um, and then, again, replaced with asphalt shingle around World War II probably. I mean, it's probably had just about every, potentially yeah, every yeah. kind of roof that's yeah. could have. been met. We, yeah, just, don't have any we just don't have any proof. Right. Do we think the asphalt roof is going to significantly change the character of the house? I don't well, really, I don't necessarily think so. And to answer that question too, I, I don't know how many of you walked by the house or went I by did. the house. The windows that were put in 1986-ish are not historic double hung windows either, if I remember, they're, they're casement Correct, windows. They're casement. So um, even though it was, um, Tower as a restoration. Uh, the restoration primarily included the removal of the stucco that had been applied over the exterior of the stone and the replacement of chimneys and then putting again this period roof on. But the windows were uh, definitely uh, put in as contemporary casement windows with divided uh, light grills. So again, it's not a, I, I don't want to mislead anybody that it's a pure restoration. Somebody went back to a very specific period in time. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, I think I'm okay with the shingles. I'm okay. I'm fine. We have a motion to approve. Wait, wait, hold on. The, the only thing that I wonder about is are any of the colors a better choice to make it look more like wood shingle? Our regulations I I do not allow us <laughs> to judge color except on permanent or semi-permanent materials those are identified as things such as a fired uh, clay tile right. um, a stone brick etc i would not consider asphalt shingle a semi-permanent or a permanent material because it's only meant to have a certain longevity to it um, so i would say that's even if it's a 50-year roof I, I, that has a that has a lifetime <laughs> to it that's not meant to be indestructible like stone or something else is supposed to be an indestructible material. So I would say you're venturing into dangerous territory to pick out the selection of, of okay. asphalt shingle. When I am reviewing them administratively, okay. um, I do not look at the color. Okay. And, and they're not proposing bright green or blue or anything like well, that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because I, I see lots of colors there. So I'm not they sure. No, arrow, we are, the color that we're proposing is, uh, is the one that's marked? It's the one that's marked, yes. Uh, pristine weather. Reddish color. Umber. Green? It's like a, no, it's like a. That was on my house. That was on my house. That is the one that they're proposing. Okay. Yeah, the green on the roof is actually moss. <laughs> right. Yeah, is there a moss color? I'm trying to get rid of the. All right. Okay, okay. All right. Right? Okay. Can we have a motion to approve? <laughs> <laughs> I move to approve uh, 207 South 5th Street as presented. All right. I'll Hamilton. second. Hamilton? Aye. Selmer? Aye. Salomon? Aye. Zinke? Aye. Roy? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item is 316 Elizabeth Place. <laughs> the next case before you is 316 Elizabeth Place. Um, it is a permit review for the proposed change of porch decking, column facing, balustrade, and stair, again with composite materials. Um, before I go too far with this, you may want to break this into two discussions one about the front porch, one about the rear porch, or you can consider as one entire project. 316 Elizabeth uh, Place is one of our individual landmarks. Um, it was, um, uh, it is uh, south of the um, Geneva Historic District and the National Register Historic District. Um, the um, house is a very impressive 
limestone Richardsonian Romanesque with Mission Revival details. Um, it has been, again, meticulously maintained um, in the last 12 years. This was a tax assessment freeze project um, that was begun in 2004 or 2005. And um, uh, so the tax credit ran out in 2017. Um, the House has recently changed hands, and a request is coming forward now to replace um, uh, the, his, the wood materials on the um, historic front porch and then on the rear porch. The proposal is to replace the materials with composite materials, which we have looked at before. The front porch um, is shown in these images. Um, and uh, from my understanding, was repaired, if not completely replaced, it was repaired as part of the tax assessment freeze um, uh, uh, program um, and, and was reviewed by the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency at that time. The uh, situation with this flooring is a little bit different than many of the porches we've seen because of the uh, nature of the Richardsonian Romanesque. The uh, house has these very um, massive stone bulkheads or, or uh, low walls surrounding the porch. So you do not see the porch floor um, um, at all because it butts into the stone steps that uh, uh, lead down to the front approach walkway. The uh, rear deck, and someone may correct me, I, I've looked back through the file, it appears to me that the rear deck is part of the renovation that was done in 2005 and is not a historic porch or a historic uh, portion of the house, but it was an addition and a modification to the original house at the rear of the building. Um, also approved by the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency under the uh, tax assessment freeze program. The proposal is to replace the porch decking, replace the balustrade, um, uh, again the railing, uh, reface the columns, match the moldings um, at the capital and the base of the, of the columns, and then also replace the uh, stair treads on the staircase itself. Um, here are some uh, images, again, of the condi current conditions. And some of the details, so you can, you can see the, uh, the porch columns are faced with uh, wood one-by material with applied moldings. And at this point, um, I would like to introduce um, uh, E-Ray Construction, and uh, they are the ones who are um, going to be doing the work here, and they can explain the project in greater detail and answer your questions about the specific details. So, and I just passed samples around. Okay. So How do we, um, this way, this way? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Eddie Ray from E-Ray Construction. Uh, I am a general contractor based out of Geneva. Uh, we have been in business for 30 years now when my dad, uh, when we moved here when I was two. So we have, uh, I've gone through the school system uh, with Mrs. Zinke, actually. <laughs> and uh, we are looking at this project as I was just approached by the homeowner. Um, we are looking at doing no structural changes whatsoever. Um, as Mr. Lambert was saying, the front porch is kind of a whole different animal from the back porch. We are looking at just removing the existing flooring and going down with this, with the AZAC PVC tongue and groove flooring. Uh, right now, we contacted the original contractor that did this in 2005, I think you said it was. Um, and right now, they are, there are two by four sleepers on a poured concrete floor on 12 inch centers with this wood over it. We're just looking to peel up the existing wood which is not in real bad shape. Um, there are some uh, soft areas uh, but there is a drainage system underneath from what I'm aware of. Um, the new material is going to be the same size, it's a little lighter color. They have a darker gray marine paint on it right now. Um, and like Mr. Lambert said, there's really no visible from the street because of the stone walls all the way around. And as far as the front porch, that's, that's all I got. Uh, the back porch, same thing. We're not looking at doing any structural changes. Um, we're just going to reface the vertical columns. We are not doing anything to any of the horizontal fascia per se, um, except for the staircase. Um, the railing right now is an existing 42-inch height, which we are going to match uh, with the new railing. This 
the new railing profile that I passed around is actually identical to the existing railing profile that's on there now, which when I actually looked at it, it was a complete shocker to me because <laughs> I've never seen a profile like this, um, and it actually matches. Um, we do a lot of work with, with AZAC material to where we can, uh, we can route and shape uh, any of the, I can buy it in sheet goods, I can buy it in all different sizes and match um, whatever trims they have, and that's what we're looking at doing. Um, the staircase, if we look here, where, my, where the line comes across where, to my note, if you look, that staircase is actually falling down. He has a, he's got tape in, fr in front of the staircase. They're not using it right now. And I think from another, that wooden post in the middle of the staircase, that was not there originally. That was put in recently to support that from collapsing even farther. So we are looking, I'm working with um, a custom stair company to fabricate the framing or bend the framing um, to redo that staircase completely uh, and bring it up to code and bring it and, and make it safe again. And um, once again, I will send this railing out, which will be the same railing. I will send this out to a company that will custom bend this railing for me and ship it back. We will have uh, intermediate posts in the staircase, so it will not be one continuous uh, piece it will be two if not three on each side um, with our runs and rises as as far and you know as up to the local code um, and I think that's about it we're not doing anything above uh, the trim work at the top of the pillars all that dental work at the top we're not doing anything there um, and I think that's about it the I don't know did the um, the porch, this is the porch floor sample. The treads of the stairs will be the decking version of this, which is just a square edge, uh, <coughs> five quarter by six okay. uh, square edge piece of decking. And that will also picture frame the outside of the porch and then our porch floor will butt into it so there'll be no visible tongue and groove seams at the, on the outside of the project. I guess Michael, I'd ask, does this in Illinois, are they also are there also examples of this with historic historically landmarked properties? Are they is it okay to use this material or? Again, the state uh, office would have allowed a composite material, most likely on a rear uh, portion. Um, this is kind of a unique situation because the only time you can see the rear elevation from Batavia Avenue is in the dead of winter when the right. foliage is down. Yeah. You can see a slight portion of this from Shady Lane. Okay. Um, so um, I brought it to you because there is some visibility of it, but this is on the rear of the home and this been a, a more traditional lot setting, the this would not even come to the commission. Um, so, but there are, you know, the state does allow for composite materials on contemporary or, or new construction. And, and again, I, my understanding, and again, maybe Margaret can correct me, but my understanding is that this porch was a new um, element um, when this house was restored um, back in 2005. Okay. So it's not, it's not a historic element of the house. So you're saying this back porch was added or was new in 2005? Correct. It is not what the historic porch was off the back of this house originally. Oh, I see. But the I, front one was not. The front is original. I, I have used AZAC material in, uh, in Palatine. I did a big project with a side porch on a corner, corner lot. I did a side porch and a front porch in the historic, society, in the historic district in Palatine. Um, was not the same color, but same material and same railing, white. Um, we, did all the dental, we did all the trim work to bring it back to its original look. Um, and that's the nice, the nice thing about this product is you can form it, you can route it, and, and, and use it like wood. Um, and then we can use a PVC, PVC safe paint on top of it to where there's m no maintenance whatsoever after the fact. And that's what I think the new homeowner is going for is um, he's trying to plan for the future to where he does never going to have to touch this stuff again. Because right now with this stuff, it's a 30 year, 30 year warranty on staining and fading, which really when you're on a covered porch doesn't, isn't a big deal, but, right, right. um, now you said there's some soft spots on the front porch, but overall it's in, you know, okay shape. Correct. And so kind of what is that? Why does the homeowner want to spend money on that if 
if it's in pretty good shape already. He approached me and said, I want to do the back. This, uh, the, main, the main part of the project was the stairs because they're falling down. Um, and I think because he knows that this is a, um, a popular place in Geneva, a, a, a famous home in Geneva, to where if he's going to do the back porch, he wants to do the front porch. He wants to keep everything, um, everything looking the same so you know, there's no issues down the road. I guess I, I was kind of following the same line. Yeah. Yeah. It, did we, was an evaluation done as to what it would cost or what it would take to repair Sounds like not. what is there? No. He, appro he called me, approached me, the homeowner, Frank Leo, uh, approached me and said, this is what I want to do. And I said, okay, I'll work on a permit. He, he liked the fact that I'm from Geneva, that I'm certified as a platinum installer in ASAC and all that stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I have no problem with the back porch, all the stuff you're trying to do. I think, mm -hmm. I think it's all great and it's going to... Yep. And I'm, I'm good with the back porch, too. Yeah, it's I, just the front porch I'm a little concerned about. Yeah. I, I wonder, could, could we suggest to the homeowner that, that um, he wait until... It really needs to be replaced and then come back. Well, when Michael said we can put do two motions, so we could do a back porch motion uh, and a front porch motion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is. It is new material from 2005, though, right? I mean, it's. It's. That's my understanding that the, the, um, the, the, the porch. Both porch decks were replaced as part of the 2005 renovation. And it's not really visible with the bulkheads at that right. point either. Right. So, then, so then you're saying that the, the front porch was new in 2005. That is not historic material. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding is that, the, that the, the porch deck was replaced. And I, I, I was on the porch a year or so ago. Maybe Margaret knows. I, mean, I think my understanding was that they, they took off the porch, the front porch. Mm -hmm. And that when they did the renovation in 2005, they went back and took pictures and brought back that porch. But I'm not 100% on right. that. Right. I have an email. And they do Sorry. have plans. Mm -hmm. uh, the homeowner has plans, uh, a whole book mm -hmm. of pictures for uh, the renovation that they did. So. I know the homeowner contacted the contractor that did the prior work in 2005, and I have an email from him. Mike um, Muller. Pardon? Mike Muller. <laughs> I think I yeah, it's sorry. it's been a while since I looked at it, but um, he basically went back and explained everything I, I said to you guys was it's two by four sleepers they when they redid that whole front porch they poured concrete put drainage system in it and then um, and then did the two by four sleepers so that's why the, that's why I'm assuming that it was all replaced in 2005 so as well as the back so porch that's all new material correct yeah. there's nothing historic there. there's nothing historic about it okay well I guess that changes my yep. point of view then well, I think that plus the visibility right right. Do we have any other comments? All right, can we have a motion to approve? Do we want to do it in two or one motion? I'm, I'm fine doing one. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll move to approve what is proposed for 316 Elizabeth Place front and back porches as presented. All right, can I have a second? I'll, I'll second it. Hamilton? Aye. Selmer? Aye. Salomon? Aye. Zinke? Aye. Roy? Aye. I'll kiss. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Last building permit application. It's probably you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. He's been sitting here. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yes. For 511 to 513 South Street. <laughs> it's 930. Isn't what? it time to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> 10 o'clock's my bedtime, so... What we have before you is the most complicated case of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a pro property in the uh, far southern portion of the local historic district. It is in the very southern portion of the... Um, uh, I'm sorry, it is, it is no longer in the, in the uh, 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 Central Geneva Historic District. It was uh, excluded in the 2016 update. So it is identified as a contributing... Um, uh, property in um, the local Geneva Historic District. Um, the project is coming for you before you because of, uh, fences in the front in the front yard are required to be approved by the Historic Preservation Commission. 
uh, this is part of a larger project that's being proposed that um, is not coming under the purview of the Historic Preservation Commission for redevelopment of the, um, the rear portion of this property for um, um, outdoor uh, 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 service. Um, so what's coming before you is the area in the red oval, which is literally a front uh, fence um, to um, uh, block off the present alleyway. The fence is, a, uh, again, a fairly traditional um, uh, metal fence. It's shown as um, four feet tall, um, but the proportions would have to change because a front yard fence cannot be any taller than 42 inches. Um, but it is shown on the drawings as four foot plus or minus, so um, this would have to comply with zoning and be, be reduced to a 42 inch high fence. Um, but other than that, uh, the fence appears to be in compliance with uh, the other uh, requirements of zoning and um, our design guidelines. At this point, if there's anything that, the, uh, that Lawrence Coleman would like to add or answer any questions about this complicated case, no, I would uh, I I invite to. him to the podium. But, uh, I'll, I'll step up in case you have any questions, but I think it's... Did you bring a sample? Yeah, I brought a sample. <laughs> is it going to be dark or is it going to be white? It's, it's black. 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 Mm -hmm. Black, mm -hmm. and it will cover the whole opening. There will be a, um, you will be able to go through. It's a 36 inch, 36 inch opening, no gate. Um, it's just side to side with 36 inch opening in the center. It's really a liquor license uh, regulation that I'm <laughs> that I'm going to be following for what they need for their exits and sure. and, and different so, criteria. So it's a fence with an opening. Correct. A secondary fence on the side. Correct. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is not will, completely blocking off. This the front. will keep people from trying to drive in there. Uh, yeah, it will. It will deter people from driving in there. Um, <laughs> <Hopefully>. because, didn't, <laughs> but, <laughs> didn't that used to be parking back there? Yes. 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 I was here to get rid of that a couple okay. of weeks right. ago. Yeah. All right. Um, which, yeah, yeah. So it's um, uh, like I said, it's it's largely for liquor control commission. Questions, comments? Can we have a motion? I move to approve the fence at, I have to get to the right address. 511 and 513. Mm -hmm. 511 and 513 3rd Street. All right, can I have a second? Wait, wait. wait as wait. presented. No, not as presented. Mm. It has to be 42 inches. Oh, yeah. Right? Per zoning. Per zoning. Per zoning. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. Hamilton? Aye. Selmer? Aye. Salomon? Aye. Zinke? Aye. Roy? Aye. Should have had you first. Well, <laughs> it was a very entertaining night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you very much. You can well, come back next month. Yeah, thank, you for, just, thank you for just coming. Just like this. <laughs> Every month, but you third Thursday. Yeah, so it'll be more entertaining. More entertaining, I see. All right, so that completes the building permit applications. Ooh. Now we have a secretary's report. Okay, I will go through my report as quickly as possible. But I do want to cover several things. Um, for, as you know, we presented three uh, awards during uh, Preservation Month on May 21st, and all the recipients were very um, uh, pleased to be honored. Uh, the, uh, the owners of 22 Campbell Street were out of town and got back the night of the awards, um, but they stopped me the other day on the street and I really appreciated being recognized and getting a certificate for their work and told me again just how much they appreciated the process and how much they love living in the uh, historic district. Um, as you saw tonight, we had several projects come forward with composite materials. I've been speaking with um, uh, David DeGroot and I expect that in the next couple of months I will be bringing forth a draft policy on the use of composite materials in the historic district, again, to uh, give us a better idea of what surfaces and, and what locations on historic buildings we find composite material acceptable and where we don't. Um, I'm assuming that will probably go through a couple of reviews and drafts by the commission, um, but I think the time is here to, to uh, tackle that in kind of a uniform uh, way. Um, on June 12th, um, I was I represented the Commission um, and the City of Geneva um, along with David DeGroote. Uh, we went to Landmarks Illinois' uh, workshop and tour of the St. Charles Hospital in Aurora. It was a really excellent opportunity to see how a, a historic building could be adapted and reused and what was required to meet the, uh, state ta the, the, the federal tax credit as well as the state tax credit. Um, 
um, and, and allow for adaptability of, of the old hospital uh, building for senior affordable housing. Um, as, as some of you are aware, or maybe I, I think I said, you, you should have all received the press release from Landmarks Illinois, but I think I also sent out an announcement that the pilot program of the five River Edge uh, communities that had the special uh, tax credit that has been extended to the entire state now with certain provisions. Um, and so um, uh, David DeGroote and I have talked a little bit about that, uh, where, where we think we can work with our economic development department to um, encourage people to use that new uh, funding tool. Um, in uh, July, I've been invited to speak before the Aurora Historic Preservation Commission about our window policy and how we enforce it and how we kind of uh, uh, review window projects. Um, they have been facing some of the same problems that we've uh, faced with uh, um, convincing people to restore windows, but also finding eligible and, and willing people to restore the windows. Um, so I will be um, there at their meeting in July. And, and where is it you're speaking? At the Aurora Historic Preservation okay. Commission. Okay, thank you. I don't have the date in front of me tonight, but it's mid-July. I believe it's July 17th, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, Can you talk about siding, too, when you're... <laughs> they have not asked me about siding, so we'll stick to windows. That, that'll be a long enough discussion. I don't think so. Um, yes. uh, just to keep you aware, permit activity remains very strong. I believe with these that you've approved tonight, I think I have 15 um, or so permits sitting on my desk to um, get out in, in the rest of this week. Uh, the survey work continues. Um, it has been a little bit slow, but one of the things I have been working on um, has been to make a determination why the properties that are identified as significant in our uh, 1999 survey, why they're significant. Um, that's a question I get very often with people who have a property and say, why is it significant? And there's nothing in the files to tell me why it's significant other than there was an architectural opinion. So I am working with the Geneva History Museum uh, to go through their files, and, and I've been doing research on my own so that there will be a brief write-up about the, either the events, the people, or the architecture, or a combination of those for each of the significant properties. There are some properties that I want to move from contributing to significant because um, I think that um, historical research has shown that there are events or people that are associated with the buildings, and uh, even if the architecture isn't um, the um, overriding element. Um, the last thing I want to say is just a kind of a personal note. As you all know, Scott is, um, this is his last meeting. We've kept him here almost as long as we have, but not right. the longest. Um, I, uh, did Kevin include this in his, all of his numbers <laughs> last night? No. No. It will add, so raise add it up a little bit. So we three more hours to it. But I, I, wanted, I do want to say that, um, you know, as, as a staff person and coming here as, you know, not really knowing the Geneva system and what have you, I really appreciate working with you, Scott. I've appreciated your, your uh, level-headedness and your calm demeanor um, in some times when uh, it was desperately needed, um, both while I was here and before I was here, as I understand the history. Um, and I will miss you, and, uh, and I do want you to say that uh, I think that uh, you really... Um, have demonstrated what it is to be committed to a community. I, I, I have worked in a lot of communities and it's very rare that you find anybody who has stuck with a public commission for no pay and for a lot of grief for tw almost 25 years. I don't years. know about the pay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I personally thank you and, uh, and I, I wish you well and uh, we'll, we'll miss our interaction. Well, it has been very fun. Here, here, here. And that ends my report, so I will open it up to, I guess you can open up to the commission now. Okay. I don't know that I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Anything from the commission? Mm -hmm. I'll just say thank you. All right. <laughs> Anything from the <laughs> public? Well, I want to say thank you, too, for all your good work over, over many what, years. What did we work on? Was that the teardown infill? Uh, uh, teardown infill yeah. task force, yeah. yeah. I do have one question, though, and it may be a dumb question, but it's about the windows on Fulton. So if there, I mean, because I know that windows is such a controversial subject. Um, so if they're totally um, rotten, then I guess they don't do replacement of the casing or the wood or what is that? Because I know there's a lot of unhappiness with that. So why were there, why was it okay on Fulton versus some other cases that have come up in the past? If that makes sense. That's a very logical question, um, and again, 
it's easier for me to answer because I've actually been in the property. Uh, some of the windows are actually scabbed together. They don't look like they are a match set. Um, they may have been from the same building that the windows were borrowed from, but the, the sash and the, the upper sash and lower sash don't seem to go together. Um, and they have really, when, when uh, Sean was explaining that some of the windows are really uh, out of kilter, the sash themselves, they, they, they truly are. He was not exaggerating. Um, he only had a few pictures there. I think if anybody's interested, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the owners wouldn't let you come in and look at the condition of the windows. Um, not only are they um, heavily painted, but they heavily painted over bad problems with the windows. So there is paint down in the split, split wood and the open tenons and stuff. So it would be a, it would be a major undertaking to replace those windows. Um, and, uh, and, and again, um, you know, he mentioned the one window currently is in a bathroom. It's a pretty much an unvented bathroom. And, you know, there's just a lot of soft, spongy wood in it. Um, they are saving the casing on both the exterior and the interior. So um, they, they uh, at least that was, that's the intention at this point. Um, it's got an 1880s bullseye and reed uh, type of um, trim around the windows on the interior. Um, so my understanding is that's going to be retained and, and, and replicated on, on new windows. Um, but this, this is a case where uh, truly looking at the windows is, is essential, and I did go out there and look at them personally. Um, um, this is not just a case where someone says it's old windows I want to replace them. There's some of the windows you can't even get all the way up because they're so um, out of shape. So, <laughs> so sometimes they can be fixed, and sometimes, like I said, and again, I think also because of the, um, the uh, as he mentioned, the, the, the change of use of some of the rooms, uh, to, to try to t unglaze the windows that are going to be in the new bathroom and glaze them with tempered glass, I think you'd probably end up losing the window by the time you took it all apart oh. to reglaze it. Yeah. Um, and there, there really is, um, I think there's like, I want to say there's seven, I think there's seven or eight windows that are old. Um, and uh, again, they're not all the same period. And the two best ones are actually covered over in the dining room between the dining room and the carport. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Windows are never easy. No. no. Yeah, we should just get rid of them all. <laughs> just do <laughs> siding. Just, just sign it over. Just sign it over. All right. Well, and, and Margaret, from, from my point of view, and I'm always the one who is screaming about windows, um, I've watched how Sean Gallagher looks at renovation, and I have accepted the fact that if Sean says they're not repairable, that they are not repairable. But only because in, in the five years I've been working here, I'm working here, I've been on the commission, I've just enjoyed how he has really become um, a terrific um, uh, architect in terms of renovating old buildings and I, I, I have there have been many times when I didn't believe what he said and that it was going to look good and he was right in the end so so I have I have confidence in what he says all right with that we have a motion to adjourn I move to adjourn Second. all right all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Thank you.